Hello and welcome back to Beyond Boards, a podcast dedicated to the actions and interests of skaters beyond skateboarding. My guest today, Ted Barrow, grew up between Texas and California, but has spent most of his life in New York City. Aside from his love for skateboarding, Ted developed a strong interest for art early on and eventually became an art historian. After 18 years spent in NYC working as a bartender, writer, lecturer, assistant curator in a museum, and walking tour guide, among other things, he relocated to the Bay Area right before the COVID pandemic started. He is well known in the skateboarding community for his Feedback TS Instagram account that he was running for a few years, and in recent times he's been hosting the amazing This Old Ledge series for Thrasher magazine, focusing on the iconic San Francisco spots for the first few episodes. So here's my conversation with Ted. I hope you'll enjoy it. So I usually start just by, you know, the basic question of how you started skating. And so I've been listening to a few interviews that you did on other podcasts uh, here and there in the last few years. So I heard somewhere that you grew up in Texas, but that you were actually born in Northern California. And uh, I think it was in a hippie community of some sort. I wasn't too sure. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I, was, I was wondering if you could tell me about maybe where you were born and moving to Texas and finding skateboarding in the middle of all this. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question um, or a great way to put it. Yeah, I was born in Marin County, just outside of a small kind of weird, arty beach town called Bolinas. And my um, parents met there in the early 70s. My father had been living there since the early 60s. He was a carpenter and an artist. And I was born on like an organic farm, kind of like a hippie commune. I mean, not like a, not your typical hedonistic, psychedelic, insanity hippie commune, but more of like a back to the land, let's like grow our own food and form like a community that doesn't depend on outside resources and You know, is that there was this kind of movement, I think, in a lot of places in the West, mm -hmm. but especially in places like California, where people left cities and moved back to the country and tried to live on farms. I mean, you can kind of get a glimpse of that at like how poorly these things worked out in Easy Rider, where it's these like <laughs> hippies in the desert and they're, they don't have any crops. But the organic farm that I was born on or near is still functioning and is doing really well, but we left. So okay. I left California when I was, you know, around almost two years old with my parents, obviously. And we moved to Central Texas. What made your parents decide to go to Texas? Did they have family over there? Or? Yes, my, um, my grandparents on my father's side lived in Central Texas. They were both Quaker pacifists who had lost their jobs during the Second World War because they opposed war. And um, my grandfather was also an academic and a librarian. And he lost his job at the Library of Congress in D.C. And so his family, who are all realtors, were like, it's shameful for you to be supported by your wife. You need to move to Texas and become a realtor like the rest of the family. Okay. So they moved into a, a new housing track. Uh, my grandmother partially designed our house, and sometime in the 70s, my father was tired of California, so we moved to Central Texas to be close to them and take care of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I grew up in my grandmother's home. So you grew up in Texas, and you like stayed there until, I don't remember what age, but you grew up there, so I, I assume that's where you started skating. Um, there were kids in my neighborhood that skated, definitely. Like, I remember kind of around eight years old, seeing kids skating and being like, I don't know, is this something I'm into? I think I'm more into like BMX and kind of doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. But um, no, it was, it was actually a, a trip back to California. We'd go back to Bolinas every summer. One summer, I kind of had had this really depressing school year before. You're 10 years old, you know, you kind of don't know who you are. I wasn't fitting in and making a lot of friends. And I spent the summer in California surfing with my older half-brother who lived in Bolinas at the time. Okay. And then I realized, like, oh, like, you can skate, too. And there's everyone was skateboarding. There were skateboards all around. And there was just some strange thing that happened where it's, like, right at the moment when I was feeling like I didn't know who I was as a 10-year-old... I also found this thing that had its own, like its own code, its own language, its own fashion. Right. And I just immediately like, like a lot of people, I mean, most people who started around when I started and like at age 10 or 11 in 1986 or 87, like anytime after Back to the Future right, yeah. and around Gleaming the Cube, they all have the same kind of thing where it's like, 
we grew up watching MTV. We grew up watching subcultures be paraded in front of us. And skate videos kind of came out of like a weird combination of like MTV and Pee Wee's Playhouse. And so like it was like a sport and a culture and a maybe way of being a punk that appealed to a certain set of people a certain generation and I was one of those people and so yeah but for me also it was about being a Californian right yeah it was like this thing that was so specifically to me about California that I think I was feeling a little bit disconnected from Texas and when I came back to Texas after that summer I was just like I'm gonna say dude I'm gonna say like I'm gonna say awesome gnarly radical <laughs> and I'm going to be a skateboarder and this will be the thing that kind of separates me from everyone else okay I see yeah it was part of your new identity yeah, it's funny because it's like, I thought I was being rebellious, but really I was just kind of conforming to a different trend that everyone else conformed to, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was different from, from what you were seeing in your immediate surroundings in Texas, so. Yeah, I was lucky enough to be encouraged to be as unique and peculiar as I wanted to be by my parents and, like, my friends up leading up into that point. So skateboarding actually, in some ways, seemed like a, a way to conform to something that wasn't so mainstream, but still right. was had its codes especially in that time like yeah skateboarding was ridiculously small compared to today yeah yeah it's, it's very hard to convey how uh how uncool it seemed to be a skateboarder at that time even if you thought it was cool yeah yeah yeah, yeah for sure and so do you remember maybe like the first mag and the first skate video that she watched around that time was that like close to when you first picked up your board or did that come maybe a bit later I mean, I definitely remember it was a Thrasher mag. There's a Thrasher, I probably can't remember the month, but it was probably at the end of summer, early fall of 1987. And it had like Christian Hasoy doing a backside air with like the boardwalk of Rio de Janeiro in the background. Like, I mean, it was like a collage or something because there's just no way he was soaring that high. <laughs> yeah on an air but i just you know like those sort of things like it was super 80s like i'm sure he's wearing like like a tank top and like spandex or some cool shorts <laughs> and a bandana but he's also just like isolated against this otherwise kind of glamorous south american beach and i just remember thinking like one is this real and two i don't even care if it's not real because it looks amazing it looks rad a word i had just recently adopted <laughs> so it was probably that thra you know a thrasher from like fall of 1987 or something mm -hmm. and then um as far as videos goes either it was probably animal chin you know like you could rent future primitive and animal chin and i and i definitely like my first board was a neil blender faces like mm -hmm. the cool you know like interlocking one is the medium size so it was black and gray and then my second board was like a lance mountain with bonite so i i must have been really feeling like powell peralta like every other kid yeah for sure I'd love to meet the, the skater whose like first deck was like a blockhead Sam Cunningham or a Zorlak or something like that. Like that would be a cool <laughs> skater. But most of the nerds that started skateboarding that I know that still skate all were like Powell fiends. Well yeah, especially at that time for sure. Yeah. But I would say future primitive or animal chin. And so as you were skating, like, uh, do you remember maybe when your interest for art kind of began? Was that when you were a teenager? Did that come later? Because I know that you eventually studied art and became the art historian that you are today. But when yeah. did that interest for art and art history maybe, when did that kind of all begin? Well, along with being a, a carpenter, my father was also, he had gone to art school and he was a painter and sculptor and he had this group of kind of funky art friends, like wherever he went, you know, and in both Bolinas and Austin. Mm -hmm. So I was always taking art classes. I was always drawing and making art. And I think I also saw that for him, it was a very frustrating life. Like he had friends that were very, very successful artists and he had friends that were just kind of weirdos that tinkered in their garages and he found himself somewhere in between those two extremes while at the same time having the responsibility of raising a family and paying bills and all that sort of stuff which he did by being a carpenter mm -hmm. so at a crucial point in my life I started to think that I didn't want to be an artist because it seemed like a very frustrating and thankless type of thing to do mm -hmm. while at the same time I recognized the value of having art around the house and having someone who like thought and cared about art in your household being my father mm -hmm. 
So I was always drawing. I was always interested in art, and I do think that I, I mean, I, I have a, some sort of mental hang-up about calling skateboarding art, but I do think that I, I mean, at the moment I started skateboarding, I just started drawing skateboarding stuff. You know, I drew, okay. I had, like, these ridiculous pictures of dudes doing airs and falling onto spikes, you know, the sort of stuff <laughs> you would draw when you're 11 years old. Yeah, yeah. I love the neon. I love the graphics. I mean, I think the, the visual component of skateboarding really, really appealed to me, be it graphics, photography, or just fashion. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I would say that the interest in art kind of predated my interest in skateboarding. And I think those first few years, skateboarding and the culture around it replaced the emptiness left by putting down toys and was enhanced by the already existing interest in, like, art and aesthetics that I had already had. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as, like, studying art, I kind of avoided it in high school and ended up you know, just focusing on art history and on the university level, and it's been a wild but fulfilling ride ever since. Right after you finished high school, did you study art history right after that, or did you do, like, uh, some jobs before that? Like, uh... Yeah, it's a little complicated, but I think at, in high school, I was probably in the... This is going to sound so stupid to say, but I, can, I think I can safely say it because there weren't that many skateboarders in Austin. I would say that I, I may have been, like... I was one of the better skateboarders in Austin. Okay. Let's yeah, put yeah. it that way. Like, I wouldn't say I had the best style. I wouldn't say I had the most original trick selection, but I was very, very determined. It was all I did. And I had two friends, Zach Martin and Jake Nunn, who rode for Think and were right, yeah. head and shoulders, like, above everyone else. I mean, they're, to this day, like, amazing skateboarders. Mm. But um, I couldn't really see myself going to college or anything like that. So I was just like, I guess I'll just move out to California and try to, you know, like, live the skateboarder life. Like, I know I'm not that good, but I don't see anything else I would do. Most of my friends who still care about skateboarding have done the same thing. Right. So I was working at a skate shop after high school, saving up enough money by living at my parents' house to, like, move out to Santa Barbara, of all places, at the end of the summer. Okay. And I was training, and there's no better way to put this, I was literally training in a parking garage at, like, midnight in June after watching that amazing Reese Forbes element ad in 4-on-1 where he skates to, like, the Cream instrumental, the Wu-Tang beat. And he does okay. a 360 flip. He does a 360 flip over a trash can standing up, like at Pulaski. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't remember that. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. But I was just like, dude, here's this, like, this is where skateboarding is headed in some weird way. Yeah. I need to start popping all my tricks over trash cans and stuff. And, <laughs> you know, I could, I could all... And so I was skating by myself. I dragged my parents' trash can from their garage to this parking garage and um, did a switch ollie over it, landed with a little too much weight on my leading side, which would have been my right foot, mm -hmm. put yep. my foot out to stop myself, and just shattered my right ankle. Oh, shit. Okay. And so I felt the crack, the pop. You know, I'd never broken a bone before. I had to army crawl to my board to use my board as a, as a crutch. Okay. And I spent the rest of the summer in bed. And in that time, I just realized, like, I was like, all right, this whole thing that my life revolved around, like, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it again. And I had no backup plan. Yeah. So I started, I took these, like, private sort of painting instruction classes, I guess you would call them, with, like, one of my dad's friends, this artist named Philip Trussell. Mm -hmm. And he would just talk to me about art and culture and about how, like, all these things kind of mixed together in his world. He was completely devoted to making art. He'd wake up at, like, three in the afternoon, paint till, like, five in the morning, go to sleep. Same thing. He'd been doing the same thing for, like, 30 years in the same little room filled with books. Wow. And it just, I'd never met anyone like that whose life was so completely filled and devoted to art making and fusing all of these ideas mm. and yet at the same time he could talk to me like I was a peer you know he didn't make me feel stupid even though I'm sure I was young and stupid and that really impacted me I think because I couldn't skate and I was like okay here's this like amazing weirdo genius guy and I'm lucky enough to spend time with this person so that led me to taking an art history class in college and that's where that kind of came out of but okay. by the end of the summer I could skate again and I spent another year skateboarding before I went to college At that time, were you like um, thinking of uh, trying to, you know, get sponsored and eventually maybe turn pro one day or something like that? Or, or was that always like, uh, I don't know if I'll ever, you know, reach that point kind of or, you know, 
I like to say that I never wanted to do that, but I think like there have been moments where I've gotten really close to like, I'll find myself in a friend group or skating with like, you know, kind of an elite squad of skateboarders who do care about sponsorship, filming, like all that sort of stuff. And, I, and I'll find that I can kind of like almost hang in those circles. Mm hmm. But um, I think by the time I was 19, if not before, I, you know, after I broke my ankle, I was like, if something like this happens again, I need to have something else that I want to do. Yeah, a backup plan or, yeah. Yeah. Sure. And also, it's just, I also realized, especially when I was in college, that actually it's like a very severely limited life that you have as a pro skateboarder. You may get to travel, but you don't really get to make the sort of contacts or have the kind of encounters that a normal person or someone who's interested in art or someone who just is traveling to like meet people outside of their small subculture mm. um, would have. This is kind of a funny story, but like I remember one, one summer I was in Paris and I was staying with, we'll can get, talk about this in a different context later, but mm -hmm. my first summer through skateboarding, I met a crew of skaters in Paris that totally took me in and showed me around. And within like a few days, I'd moved out of my youth hostel and I was staying with them and I was skating these amazing spots around Bastille like all the time. And I think my second or third summer out there, I was like dating a French girl and like living at her place. And um, I heard some story about a visiting pro like kind of drunkenly hitting on her. Okay. Like the summer before and like what it what a like, you know, oafish, ugly American asshole he was. <laughs> You know, and this is someone who, to this day, who's skateboarding, I completely admire. And I'm not, like, dissing this person. But I was just like, how lucky am I that I don't have this, like, duty to skate and party that I get to, like, actually have genuine friendships with people and experience this culture that I really love on a deeper level. Because... Yeah. I'm not just here to skate. Skateboarding enhances the quality of my life, but it's not the thing that my life revolves around. And I, I was probably 20 years old or something like that. So mm. when I recognize that, I kind of, since then, I haven't really had any desire to be sponsored or okay. live that life. I mean, I also just, I'm also aware that I, I know what good skating looks like and I can come close to it, but I'm not like... I was never there, you know, I've always been mediocre and I've always sort of had to negotiate and just be like, I'm doing this because I love it, not because I want to be the best. So uh, what brought you to Paris uh, these summers that you just mentioned? Was that, was that before you moved to New York? Yeah, it was before I moved to New York. The first trip I took to Europe in 1997, the first day I was in England and I sprained my ankle skateboarding, trying a backside ollie in the little fountain of the Buckingham Palace at the Victoria Memorial, like in London. Okay. That first day, I'm still jet lagged and I sprained my ankle and I, I couldn't skate for a month. Oh, damn. And I, again, in a weird way, like I had this, like, I just traveled around Europe like a tourist, you know, staying at hostels and going to museums and being surrounded by Australians. And, and I didn't meet any other Europeans. Okay. And we were in Rome. I was traveling with a friend of mine and we were supposed to go to Spain. But of course, to get to Spain from Rome, you have to go to southern France. And this being France, all the train station workers were on strike. As usual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Lucky, lucky for me. So instead, we ended up going straight to Paris. Okay. A place where neither of us wanted to go. And then I got there and I was like, holy shit, like this whole city is paved in this really smooth asphalt. There's the Eiffel Tower. There are all these skate spots. You know, I remember that, you know, Metrospective from 4 and one number 19 or whatever, like with all those dudes skating Le Dome and, and Bastille. And mm -hmm. I was just like, I'm going to skate towards the Eiffel Tower because that's like, I think Le Dome's near there. Mm -hmm. I get to the Eiffel Tower, you know, the pools underneath it. The, that's they're, not they're there empty. anymore, but yeah, yeah. Okay, well, like, At the time, like, those pools got drained every seven years. So the time that they had been drained before was when they were filming video days there. That's right. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that. It was in video days, yeah. Yeah. And, and then so the next, it's 1997. It's seven years later. Like, they're empty and it's these perfect bowls and quarter pipes and hips. Right under the Eiffel Tower of Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and so I just felt so incredibly lucky. And I met some kids and they were like, they're actually like American diplomat kids. Like, their parents lived, you know, nearby and they're like, oh, you You should go to this, you know, Le Dome. Mm -hmm. That's where all the good skaters skate. And then I go to Le Dome and someone's like, you should go to Bastille. That's where all the other sk good skaters skate. At the <laughs> time, there was this great, like, beef between, like, skaters from Bastille and skaters from oh, Le Dome. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, it was very interesting. <laughs> kind of <laughs> funny. 
like Franck Baratario and Stéphane Laurent and all those dudes like who came from one part of Paris like weren't really fucking with like Samir and Benjamin Debert and Salim and like Raphael and Antoine and Jan and all those dudes on the other side I think it had to do with just footage but um <laughs> anyway so within a week I, I met like yeah all the, all the people locals. I just mentioned yeah and you know went on the tour I think we went to Lausanne we went to Montpellier and I ended up in Marseille and there was like you know it was like all of a sudden I'm sort of living the life of like a touring skateboarder which yeah, I never, yeah. never experienced because you know Samir and those dudes were they were the sponsored guys and so they were like kind of serious about like going to all the contests going to the demos getting photos like shooting interviews like whatever so mm. That was really, it was fun. And so every summer while I was in college, I sort of lived the life of a touring skateboarder and I kind of got to feel like what it was like to maybe be a sponsored skateboarder and do this travel thing. But at the same time, I'm studying art history. So yeah. my appreciation of a city like Nîmes would be like half like it's amazing like marble plazas and half, you know, the Maison Carré and the Pont du Gard and like all these like amazing Roman aqueducts and infrastructure. So mm -hmm. Looking back on it, it was so incredibly fortunate. Stimulating. And, yeah, and, and, and I was just so grateful that I met a cool crew of skaters that took me around. I mean, despite wanting to be a Californian, I grew up in Texas, and I was fairly ignorant and sheltered. And like I said, I had no desire to go to France before I went to France, and then I fell in love with it. I think I heard somewhere that you were considering actually moving to France before you <laughs> eventually went to New York, but it, was that, is that true? Yeah. Or, yeah? <laughs> I mean, it was sort of natural that like, you know, Samir and I, especially we, um, we really clicked and Samir is like such a great ambassador. He, I mean, he speaks perfect English. He's like went to New York all the time. Like he was the guy that would take you around. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm not unique in that. And he and I decided, like, his roommate, Tristan, was moving in the fall of 2000, and I was going to move into his place in Paris. Okay. And so, you know, I, I didn't have any other plans, which is, again, out of my own ignorance. I was just like, yeah, of course, I'm going to live in France. This will be great. So after spending a week in New York, I move into Samir's place, and it was then that I realized <laughs> that the France that I was experiencing in July and August was the summer, and it's when everyone's on vacation, and no one's working, and everyone's happy, and everyone's drunk, and everyone's traveling. <laughs> yeah. But the Paris that I experienced in, like, the fall was... Much uh, back gloomier. To work. Yeah. <laughs> Much gloomier. Yeah, a lot less sun. <laughs> For uh, sure. The energy was very different. And I also realized that I had completely... I was woefully unprepared for life on my own in a new city, in a country and culture that I was unfamiliar with. And I just barely spoke enough French to get by. But really, everyone was speaking English with me. And that, you know, was considerate of them. But it really prevented me from, like... Yeah, learning a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like the first major kind of disastrous <laughs> experience of like, yeah, which needed to happen. You know, I was like 23 or 24, but like, yeah, I went there triumphantly thinking that I was going to spend the rest of my life in Paris or France and left about maybe 10 weeks later with my tail between my legs, heartbroken, not <laughs> knowing if I would ever go back to Paris again. So that led to me like ending up in New York, basically. Oh, okay. So after this uh, experience in Paris, that was a little disappointing. That's when you moved to New York. I ended up spending another year in LA uh, where I'd gone to college. I'd lived in LA like through college, like through the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just, LA was what I knew. So I ended up back there and actually really enjoyed it. I didn't love it the first four years, but like that year after living in Paris, I was like, oh yeah, LA. <laughs> Anything <great>. is better. <laughs> Yeah. And at that time, I was also I had this like great crew of friends that all lived and skated on the West Side. And it just seemed like there was like a really cool moment in skateboarding in L.A. at that time. Like you had like USC and like Danny Lebron and the Fernandez brothers. Oh, yeah. And like, mm. you know, like there was this kind of Chris Franzen and just like Robbie McKinley and all these people like it was like the next gener next wave of skateboarders after like the girl and kind of main movers in like the prime menace world industries type thing. Right. It was a very cool place to be, but I realized that the art side of me was not being satisfied and I wanted to move and move to New York. So okay. yeah, I moved to New York in 2002. And so, yeah, as you just said, what prompted that desire to go to New York was to work in art, basically, like find a job around art, basically. Did, did you have like a plan of what you were going to try to do or... 
No, I mean, I was fairly young, and despite my soul-crushing disappointment of living in France, like, I was still pretty, like, confident that I could fall into something that would be rewarding. But, uh, no, in, in L.A., I was working at a production house, like mm -hmm. a post-production studio for sound, for commercials, and at a bar. And I was like, this is all kind of, like, entertainment industry adjacent. I want to work in a sort of entertainment industry adjacent field, or art industry adjacent field in New York. Okay. Whether it be like at a museum, at an arts foundation, at galleries for an artist, studio assistant, whatever. Like, I'm sure if L.A. is to the entertainment industry, what New York is to the art world, I want to be in the art world. I'm going to go there. Yeah, yeah. So, Makes um, sense, for sure. Yeah. And that resulted in a lot of unpaid internships for the first year <laughs> and really weird art jobs that didn't last very long. And also it actually resulted in my like commitment to skateboarding getting even deeper because I realized that like New York is one of these places where if you skate, it can lead you having access to really cool people in other fields. Like, you know, it was like, mm. I don't want to romanticize it too much, but it just sort of seemed like unlike any place I'd ever been before, even more so than Paris, like the skateboarders hung out with like artists and musicians and photographers and fashion people. And if you wanted a genuine connection, it wasn't like I was that calculated about it, but I just realized that skateboarding felt and looked a lot cooler in New York than it ever had had anywhere else and this was this moment like after september 11th 2001 when right yeah you know it was like ryan mcginley there's this whole thing of like vice magazine and like all this sort of like everyone who is doing something really interesting or exciting in other industries did have a background in skateboarding and we all hung out at the same places okay and so I, I, again, without like being too calculated about it, I, I worked in these kind of boring art jobs, but then I realized that I had a much more authentic and real connection through the downtown kind of social circles that I was in to doing more interesting things that mm. sort of fuse these things, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was a weird time and it was a time before the internet and before social media and all that, mm. but it was like, you had to be at a certain place and you kind of had to be open to... I'll put it this way. I mean, I didn't have any gay friends growing up. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen a non-male skateboarder growing up. And one of the most appealing things to me about like being in New York at that time was like a lot of the prejudices and I don't know, kind of hangups I had about like other people. I had to get over those things really quickly. And I knew that it was bullshit, but I just like it was like putting it into practice. It was just like, OK, like this dude Kunle is like one of the most legendary graffiti writers in the scene right now. He can inward heel flip over a trash can and he's openly gay. That's mm -hmm. amazing. You know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just like and he's like our friend and we see, like he's our homie. Like I, I know that sounds kind of now it sounds a little bit antiquated and like Yeah, but we're talking early two thousands, you're young and you hadn't been like you hadn't been in contact with people like that before. So yeah. it was like a, Yeah, it was like a crash course into like just like learning how to be cool around people who are different than you that you exactly. have maybe been conditioned to be afraid of or uncomfortable around. Mm -hmm. So that was you know, revelatory. But but also it's like New York had these museums. It had amazing galleries and museums and I would make it a point to go to the Met or the Frick or any of the sort of, or MoMA, you know, at least once a week, just to kind of be in touch with the world of ideas and, you know, a different type of contemplative space. And New York had that in spades. So that was, mm. a, it was a great place. Yeah. So that was 2002 when you moved out there. And I think you stayed until 2020, right before COVID. I thought that was interesting, actually, that you arrived right after 9-11 and you left right before COVID. Yeah, it was an 18-year-long sweet spot. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I heard somewhere that you you said you might go back to New York one day. And I was like, like thinking like, oh, if he goes back, that means something bad will have happened right before. Some, like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting for the next catastrophe. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, again, like in a weird way, like the way that I approached Paris, like I, I didn't think I would leave New York. I thought for what I wanted in my early 20s, New York continued to satisfy me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm, I'm glad I left. And my choice for leaving in 2020 before the pandemic was logical. And it was a sensible choice. It was the sort of choice that, a you know, the sobering choice that a, someone in their early 40s should make, which was mm -hmm. that I, I was far away from my, Your family? my family. Yeah, my mother. And, uh -huh. you know, I was burnt out and completely exhausted. And that last year of living in New York was pretty dark. Mm hmm. 
And I realized that the things that I loved the most about the city were the things that now drove me crazy about it. You know, it was like all the romance and all the sort of like drama and all the excitement. It all seems like overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Joan Didion writes about that and in, in, uh, she writes this wonderful. Now I forgot the title of the essay, but wonderful essay about like moving to and then leaving New York. Goodbye to all that. And she okay. sort of talks about how like, you know, like when she first gets there, there's this like destiny around every corner and boundless possibilities and by the end of it she can't leave her apartment because she's so depressed and <laughs> it wasn't quite like that for me but it's a, a similar sentiment for sure and so when you were living in new york i heard somewhere that you lived for a long time on the upper west side yeah but you must have like lived in different apartments over eight, the course of 18 years mm -hmm. i lived in four different apartments i, I lived for oh, a year it. and a half okay. in, yeah I, w i thought it was going to be like maybe 10 or something <laughs> No, no, no. Four was enough. I lived uh, uh, for a year and a half in Williamsburg, right next to uh, like a highway entrance. And it's now a very cool neighborhood. And I guess mm. it was kind of cool then, but it didn't seem that cool. Wasn't as gentrified as it is today. Yeah. There were still drug dealers and like, you know, like some of the blocks heading towards like the Marcy stop on the J were pretty rough. But um, uh, whatever. I mean, I didn't spend that much time there. Okay. And then I lived in downtown Brooklyn, kind of in Borum Hill on Atlantic Avenue. And like, what is to this day the nicest apartment I ever lived in? Like a, basically like the third floor, top floor loft that I shared with two other people. Nice. And uh, then I lived in a small one bedroom apartment off of Spring Street in lower Manhattan, kind of West Soho. Okay. And then, then where I ended up for 13 years on the Upper West Side at 85th Street. Yeah, so you spent, yeah, the longest amount of time was in that apartment in, on, on Upper West Side. Yeah. What's that neighborhood in Paris that's like where the Boot Chaumont is? That's like where I am right now. It's the 19th. It's uh, Belleville, uh, Jourdain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Pyrénées. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, I sort of think of like that neighborhood in Paris is kind of like the Upper West Side of Manhattan. There's, you know, it's, it's landscaped, it's hilly. There's, it was built within a certain time. That's kind of the, the Parisian of, of equivalent of the Upper West Side is where you live. Mm -hmm. It's a great neighborhood for podcasters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this apartment in a few weeks, but uh, yeah, I'm going to go live in the fifth. That's on the Rive Gauche, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The South Bank. But uh, yeah, I, I need to change places, unfortunately. This place that, where I'm at is too expensive. So, so yeah that was kind of what i was experiencing on the upper west side as well <laughs> <laughs> so did you have like a, a favorite place among all of these in new york or i guess this place on upper west since you spend the longest uh, must have been uh, kind of your favorite spot or the upper west side was a nice no one went up there none of my friends from downtown or brooklyn unless i specifically invited them for like i would have these drawing salons where i'd have people come over to my house to draw on tuesday nights or if they weren't coming up to visit me at a museum, no one would go up there. So I was kind of by myself. Mm -hmm. And it seemed at the time like this sort of timeless neighborhood of families and old New York traditions, which really appealed to me and I felt like I could grow into. But um, I've spent most of my social time and skateboarding time downtown. Okay. You know, like labor opened up on Canal Street. You had the LES skate park that got revamped in 2012 or something. And that seemed like, uh, I mean, that was just like kind of where all my old friends were and where all my newer friends were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember the, the year that I left, I realized that I'd had two kind of devastating romantic like relationships within a block of Canal and Allen Street. Within the last year too, I was just like, shit, like I can't go to this block because I'm afraid of running into two people that are like kind of you know, like I have a weird relationship. With yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And that was that feeling that the city is sort of enclosing on you. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. I would still, I, was, I guess they call it Dime Square now. That was luckily not what it was called when I was living in New York, but it's this little kind of like cluster of bars and skate shops and boutiques and stuff like around Canal and Orchard. And so when you were living in New York, as you said, you were working, like you did a few different jobs uh, revolving around art. And I yeah. know that right before you left New York, you were working as a curator, uh, assistant curator, right, for a museum. Can you tell me a bit about the different jobs that you did during this uh, whole period? I mean, I'm sure there were plenty, but uh, and I, I think you were doing several jobs actually at the same time, like you were bartending at some point. I read that you were also doing like um, tours of New York City for people. Uh, and I want to ask you about that afterwards. But like, yeah, yeah. can you tell me yeah. about some of the sure. jobs that you did throughout that whole time period? I mean, 
A smarter person would have realized, looked at the writing on the wall and figured out another racket. But I, I was the sort of person who would be so thrilled to take an art job that I wouldn't realize how poorly it paid or how little room for advancement upwards there would be. So my first few years, I would work at a gallery and, you know, expect a better position to materialize, which, of course, it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I was always I would work art jobs up until the point where I realized, like, they're not going to give me a better job. I'm not going to get like into a better position. Or if I am going to get in a better position, I actually won't like that position. So then I would go back to like, it's usually bartending. I was a bartender for about seven years. And I started graduate school for my doctorate in art history while I was still a bartender, which was actually very good because you could work like two or three nights a week and make enough money to pay rent and food. And then I had the rest of the time to study and read and go to classes and do all that. Okay. That was pretty exhausting, though. I mean, seven years of... And plus, New York bars, like, close at four in the morning. Yeah. So, for my own sanity, I decided to earn about a third, two-thirds less, and just work as a teacher, as an adjunct professor at local schools. And I taught art history, which was, like, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But I made no money. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I made a little bit. And it must be a lot of work, right? Like, the amount of time you spend in front of students versus time preparing your classes and grading students and everything. I'm sure it's a lot of work. Yeah. It was about three hours prep for every hour spent lecturing. Okay. And then, yeah, like, I don't even, countless hours grading exams and preparing, you know, stuff for my students outside of, like, the lectures. Mm. But, you know, it was very rewarding, too. It was, like, the first... I think, you know, when you're in graduate school, so much of the work you do feels kind of demoralizing and you're insecure about where you are and being able to teach is in some ways a performance of mastery, like where you're showing, I actually know this and I want you to know this. And also, it's like, for me, at least, I got to tap into like my passion for this material. And I realized like, like, if I'm just getting near how great my undergraduate lecturers were, like, if I can impart any of the sort of information and enthusiasm and interest that my teachers expressed to me in those lectures, like, Mm. I'll be doing a great job. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. I had excellent teachers at Occidental and undergrad. And all I was doing was a sort of poor impression of them as a lecturer (laughs) for the, you know, five or six years that I taught in New York. But yeah, so I did that. And I was also a walking tour guide. I was actually a walking tour guide. So there's like, yeah, there's like bartending. And then while I'm bartending and I'm still in graduate school, I'm also a walking tour guide. And then when I decided to start teaching, I was like, okay, I'm going to eliminate bartending. And now I'm going to teach and be a walking tour guide. All of this while I'm still in coursework or in studying for exams and doing my own academic stuff. And I continued to be a walking tour guide just because it was so rewarding and I Mm. didn't have to grade my guest papers, which was great. For sure. Up until basically I started working as a an assistant curator at a museum just outside of New York City in New right. Yorkers. The Hudson Museum, right? Yeah, the Hudson River Museum. And uh, I was there for about two and a half years. And I, I again, like I didn't have enough time, as much time to give walking tours and stuff like that. So it was around that time that I started to make Feedback TS, like my like joke Instagram account. Yep, yep. I try to start selling like products and like stickers so I could supplement my income that way. I mean, you know, for other reasons too, but I was just like, I'm having this weird double life as a museum curator and kind of working a pretty rigorous nine to five job. It had a substantial commute. And then I have this other thing that I'm doing that's like nobody really understands, including myself. (laughs) It seems to be very, very popular and very confusing for everyone involved. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you about feedback TS afterwards, but uh, yeah. And so these historical walking tours that you gave in New York, like, um, did you have this idea on your own? Or did you see other people doing it? Like, where did the inspiration to start doing that come from? I I think it came from just being an outsider. You know, like New York's one of these places where it's like any any city. I mean, I'm sure you experienced this to some extent in Paris, where native Parisians or native New Yorkers have their own connection to a city that you can never have. Yeah. You know, if you've gone to like preschool in Paris and lived in the same, like Samir and his friends, like Samir has the same crew of friends that he's had since he was 10 years old. And they all grew up in the same neighborhood and they've all been skating the same places. Like I will never have that. I'm mm-hmm. always going to be an outsider no matter where I am. Right. But as an outsider, 
I can learn about the buildings and I can learn about the history and I can learn about the thing, the big ideas that attract people like me to these amazing places. And I realized that after about a decade of living in New York that I, one, had all this information that I wanted to share with people. Mm -hmm. And I'd always wanted to give tours. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like, it's just like, especially in graduate school, like you, you learn how to convey information with clarity and passion and interest. And so it just right at a crucial time, like two friends of mine, Alice and Caroline, that I was in graduate school with, were talking about this side job they had of giving walking tours. And I was just like, I need to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it a, it's a sort of selfish type of work where it's so much fun for me to talk about New York City and its history and the architecture and the big ideas that should pull everyone in. But also because it's New York, like the audience is already on your side. Like who doesn't yeah. want to learn more about New York City? Sure, everyone yeah. has an idea about this place. Mm. And so for me, that was it was also a way of like as skateboarders, we're already comfortable on the street. Yeah. We already know, know how to assert space and to be around other people without taking up too much of their space. We have street smarts and street eyes. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I felt I mean, it seemed like I was uniquely Uh, qualified or skilled poised qualified yes to be a walking tour guide in new york because i was just like i have this background of skateboarding where i've been on streets and sidewalks since i was a little kid and i have this background in academia where i've learned how to convey ideas mm. and like there's nothing i love more than new york at the time so this is perfect yeah I heard somewhere that you gave up to like 20 something different tours. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Different itineraries or different themes like. Uh... Yeah. So the, the company I work for is called um, Big Onion Tours and they still even without me, they give excellent tours because that's where I learned all my stuff. But um, they offer different neighborhoods like you sort of learn the script of a uh, oh, different okay. neighborhood, the big themes. And so, yeah, a lot of guides only had time for about, you know, three or four tours, like says all they could handle. Mm -hmm. And I get that. But I was just like, why wouldn't I want to learn about like all of New York? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like every neighborhood I possibly can. And, and, and also it's just, it's good strategy because the more tours you can do, the more available to give them you are and sure. the more yeah, money yeah. you potentially make. Yeah. Did you cover like all of New York City? Was it the five boroughs or was it like, I guess, mainly Manhattan and maybe some areas of Brooklyn and Queens? Or Yeah, I had a couple Brooklyn tours, Vinegar Hill, Brooklyn Bridge, Brooklyn Heights, downtown Brooklyn, but mostly it was Manhattan. It was also okay. a matter of convenience just because like most tourists are going to want to learn about Manhattan. Right, they're right. In Manhattan, of course. And I'm in Manhattan, so I know that island very well. And it's already so big, like there's so much to cover. Yeah. So you said you were working for this company that organized tours. Yeah. Would you do tours that they had, you know, thought of or configured themselves? Or did you kind of do tours that you designed? And I was wondering if you had done tours dedicated to skate spots or skateboarding <laughs> or stuff like that. Because like when I heard that you were doing this for a while, it made so much sense. When you see this old ledge, you're like, oh, that's basically kind of the yeah. same thing. You're like giving a tour of like iconic spots in SF for this first series of pieces. But uh, can you tell me a bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So there's several levels to like being a tour guide in New York City. Like you have to learn, you have to take like a, a city licensing tour guide licensing exam where you have to like all the major facts like the, you know, the sort of indigenous history of, of Manhattan, the Dutch founding, the English colonial period, like, all you know, all the things that were invented when the Brooklyn Bridge was built, all, all sort of stuff like famous residents, like you have to sort of know all that stuff to get a license as a tour guide. Okay. And then the company, Big Onion, they have like their sort of ground foundational information that you have to learn as well. And that's usually in the downtown scripts because that's the oldest part of Manhattan. And then each neighborhood has its own script and each script is about the equivalent of about like five hours of information, which mm -hmm. you pick and choose like what you think is important about each neighborhood based on, in my case, like based on my own interests. So I often gave tours that were skewed towards like the cultural architectural history of a place. And, mm. you know, if I don't know a lot about like music or food, I'm not going to be talking about music or food as much as someone who specializes that in their studies would do. Uh -huh. And so I very seldom gave tours that talked much about skateboarding unless because I kind of knew that like my audience wasn't interested in skateboarding. Yeah, you know, like you can tell when you're giving a tour and you're talking a little, you're being a little too self-indulgent about what you're interested in. You can tell people's eyes kind of glaze over or they they're losing interest. Yeah. Yeah. So 
my East Village tour started out at Astor Place. And that, of course, is like for me, for like someone who grew up skating and paying attention to skating in the 90s, like Astor Place is huge, even though yeah, it's yeah. like kind of a, a non spot. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I would mention skateboarding there. But no, I, I, um, I think the training that I got just to like sort of get the big facts about a city mm -hmm. and then the sort of points of interest in the architecture and the cultural history, that layer, that does constitute some of the background research that I do for this old ledge. Mm -hmm. But it, it is, I think, kind of a jump to, uh, at least for me, to kind of like apply that same sort of discipline of like learning the architectural history and like why a building was built and applying that to skateboarding. Like, I know mm -hmm. a few people do that, but that's the most challenging and rewarding thing for me is, is like sort of taking that training as a tour guide and a researcher and a, an academic and lecturer to talk about skateboarding and in some ways take skateboarding as seriously as my colleagues who don't skate take their area of specialty, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure. And I, and I don't mean take it like treat skateboarding as a serious thing, but just kind of look at it through this like intense lens of like, this is why this matters to us or these are this is why these spots draw us to them and so tell me about maybe leaving new york because that was right before covid started you left in february 2020 right yeah you said before that you you went back to cali to be close to your family and everything and you also said that you were maybe a little bit burnt out on all the different many different things you were juggling with like all the different jobs and yeah Was there like a pivotal moment that kind of made you decide, okay, I'm done, I'm going to Cali and leaving New York? I think there were a few. Um, in the spring of 2019, I lost my job at the museum. And I think for both my employers and myself, that was absolutely the right decision. But it was a decision that was still pretty shocking and traumatic for me to process. And I mean, I think leading up to that, there is this momentum and inertia of like what I was doing with feedback and how kind of consuming being on my phone that much was. Yeah. And this kind of like stasis of how slowly things move working in a museum context. Mm. Mm. It was like hard for me to kind of like reconcile, like just think about like any, anyone who posts on social media, you get this immediate dopamine rush and this sort of weird manic sense of like excitement, anger, horniness or depression <laughs> that like social media is literally designed to encourage. And on the other hand, things move at a very glacial pace in a museum or in any yeah, sort of not-for-profit yeah. institution where the cool idea that you have one day will will turn into a, a museum exhibition or label or some sort of project that reaches fruition to, you know, like a year and a half later. Yeah, yeah. And all things happen by committee and all these sort of things, which is great. And, and it's so impressive. And this was a really great place to work. And the people that I worked with were amazingly committed and, and brilliant people, but it just... I just realized I'm like a part of me is like this weird skater that still loves talking about skateboarding and to work at the level that they wanted me to work at that museum would have meant sacrificing quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But it was also sort of realizing that like as an art historian, here was this career path that I could have taken, but it would have meant like sacrificing the things that I really, really loved. And I, I was very confused because I was like, I've just been going through graduate school. I'm almost finished with my PhD. This is the sort of job I would want to have. And I'm miserable here. Mm. And also then to have this like very addictive set of behaviors on social media, be connected to this passion that I had for skateboarding, which was lifelong, sincere and ever evolving. It just left me very, very confused by March. You know, like I lost my job and I was like, well, I'm still <laughs> I still got this pop and Instagram account and now it's spring and I can skate more. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, like giving walking tours and teaching It just felt like I was returning to a previous self or a previous skin that I'd already shed, if that makes any sense. Yeah, you didn't feel like you were moving um, forward, moving kind forward. of. Yeah, it, it, like, like that a lot of like potential possibilities had been exhausted. And now I was actually, it was the first time in my life where I felt like I was either stagnating or like you said, like not moving forward, moving backwards. Mm. And again, you know, I was, I guess I was 42. I was single. Most of my friends, one way or another, were like were married with kids or had like bigger responsibilities. And I realized I was kind of living like I was a, a 20 year old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mike Burnett, an alum of your podcast. Yeah. 
we were talking about this moment where when you go to a city as a skateboarder, you kind of like realize like you well into your 30s and maybe even 40s, you might be sleeping on someone's couch because that's what you're used to as a skateboarder. And then you realize like, oh, wait, I'm an adult. I could actually get a hotel or, or, or Mike <laughs> says something where he's like, he's like, yeah, like as a skater, you, you realize that there are actually things called spoons and you don't have to like try to eat your cereal with a skate tool. <laughs> and, and, and then to some extent, I kind of realized that I was I would only felt comfortable moving through the world as a skateboarder mm. but somehow that meant like being independent and being far away from my family and and at, at 42 or however old I was I was just like this doesn't feel right you know I have learned to fully exploit this place in this city as someone who lives only for themselves and I have a lot of great stories about this place but I don't have a great life not at that time at least yeah Right, exactly. I mean, I was sort of just taking stock of what everything that had happened and just being like, what the fuck? Mm. Also, in that in that year, my mother had gotten in two car accidents and broken her ankle, like getting something out of the closet. And I was just like, I've lived in New York longer than I've lived anywhere else, but I she's getting older and then I should, I care about this person. I should be close right, to her. Yeah. There's, there's, you know, there's a weird time when you like, you realize that you're, if you don't have a partner and children, that your duty is to people that raised you. And I wanted to be close to her, so... And sure. also, like, yeah, yeah. there are worse places to return to than California. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's a midlife crisis. So you moved back to Cali, and you're still out there right now. Yeah, I, uh, I moved back in February of 2020. The, you know, the pandemic hit. You uh, missed, uh, yeah, I mean, if you had been in New York, it would have been... Uh... It would have been devastating. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was very hard in New York, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I found myself safe and comfortable and close to the people I cared most about. And I had a good crew of old friends or new friends that, you know, wanted to skate every day that lived nearby. And we would just skate this like it was sort of like this purifying ritual, like where all my expectations and all my sort of like prejudices about how great New York was. None of that fucking mattered because now I was in California and we had this like blue ledge that was pretty shitty and some nice <laughs> asphalt and some, you know, like sun every day. And mm -hmm. I was just skating my ass off and I realized like, I don't know, the older you get, and I'm sure other people have talked about this on the podcast, but like, it seems like whatever reason you started skateboarding, whatever reason you continue to skate, at a certain point, it comes down to recognizing that you may not be able to skate like this tomorrow. And so... Yeah you really start to value it as this thing, this continuous thread that you've been actively involved in that could end any day. Yeah. And that really, that idea really was like galvanized for me during the pandemic where I was just like, you know, I'll, we don't know what tomorrow is going to look like because we could not have foreseen this crazy global pandemic shutting down life as we know it. Yeah. It, it's like life got whittled down to these like, okay, I have like a distant connection to my friends through our phones. I have a direct connection to my family, my closest family. And I have this activity with my friends and that's all that I have. And that's enough to sustain us, you know? Yeah, yeah. Not that at any other time in my life I needed a reason, another reason to love or depend on skateboarding. But in that time for us, I think that was like absolutely crucial. It was survival. You mentioned before uh, doing the Feedback TS uh, account. You were doing that for a few years, and I think you stopped doing it around the time that you moved to Cali, or maybe not, not long after you arrived over there. Yeah. But uh, can you tell me a little bit about doing that? I mean, you've, you've talked about it in different interviews and podcasts and everything, but like it was basically like a satirical kind of account. And tell me a little bit about, about doing that. Okay, well, it, it, um, I'll try to find a way to describe it where I'm not repeating things I've said in other podcasts. But um, I will say that, like, when I started that account, I really just sort of thought of it as like a, a very obviously not serious account. Right. You know, I was like, there's no way that anyone is going to take what I'm saying here seriously, because this is so ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I definitely underestimated my audience because I was like, most of the people who are going to be following my account are also going to be people in my position who are older, who didn't grow up on social media, who almost didn't grow up with the internet, and will see the whole project of like skateboarding on Instagram and talking about skateboarding online as absurd as I see it. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. from, from the very beginning, I was just like, anything I say is fair play because this whole thing is complete bullshit. Yeah, it's not serious. Right. 
but then of course it, you do it's like any it's like a drug <laughs> like mm-hmm. you do anything long enough and whether you you are approaching it from a satirical position a point of critical to remove or not it kind of consumes you you know mm-hmm. and i'm grateful that it led to me having some sort of position and platform in skateboarding you know like i currently am doing kind of what i've always dreamed of doing and i could not be more delighted and i and i have to credit that account for leading indirectly to that sure on the yeah. other hand i just like i probably would have finished my dissertation or 3 years earlier <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah and I probably would have, I don't know, I mean, I'm lucky enough that everyone I've met who knows me from that account has been really cool to me, but I'm sure that there are some people out there who really did not like what I was doing and have, like, some very negative ideas about who I am. Which, you know, mm. it would be insane of me to try to, like, worry about what a stranger thinks of me. But I just, like, I realized that I probably had inadvertently upset people that didn't deserve to be upset by me. Yeah, but it was never your intention, so... I mean. Oh, absolutely not. And and just to clarify, I've said this before, but every bad review I gave was given with the permission of the skateboarder. You know, I would tell skaters, like, hey, if, if you want, like, a, you know, kind of weird one that's sort of positive, I can do that, but people aren't going to like it. But if you want, like, a roast, those are usually more popular. And, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. just know that I don't mean this seriously. This is just, uh, this is entertainment. How hard can I go, yeah. Yeah, but... The other thing, too, that I learned through that is that you obviously can't control how anyone takes what you're saying or how they experience what you're putting out there. In the same way that, like, I can see something that will get me so offended, like, online, not knowing what the person meant when they wrote it, said it, put it out there, whatever. The context in which they put this out. Right. I mean, it's sort of... We all know this now, but I think at the time I, I did not realize, one, how sort of, like our feelings were sort of being weaponized to generate content and mine information by these same companies that were creating these apps where we're putting all this shit out there. Mm. And two, that no one, you know, like I didn't have some sort of masterful control over what I was saying and how it was taken. Like, Yeah, perceived or received. Yeah, so it was a um, crazy lesson in internet addiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you stopped it in 2020. When did you start it? Uh, the spring, early summer of 2017. So oh, okay. So it was three like years. three oh, years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a long time. I mean, I did like 3000 plus videos. Yeah. That's so. a lot. I think you mentioned also that you were getting sometimes like some hate mail or just people kind of, um, they didn't perceive what you did, uh, positively yeah. that like they were offended or whatever. I was wondering how, how did you like deal with that? Uh, I mean, I, At first, I didn't take it very seriously because I was just like, this is, you know, I tried to focus on the good responses that I was getting. Sure. And also that I kind of realized that, you know, I only really know about 20 people in the world. And if at any time, 15 of those 20 people that I actually know are cool with who I am and how I act towards them, then that's all that really matters. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It would be pretty insane to think that I could have a genuine connection with anyone that I've not met in person and not spent a significant amount of time with. I wouldn't want that, you know? So, Mm. but on the other hand, yeah, absolutely. I mean, all of our brains are wired to have a kind of negative bias. And I certainly found myself getting worked up over people's crazy reactions and responses that may have been you know, like plan to kind of like, I definitely got trolled. I definitely got harassed. I definitely had people threaten me and spent a lot of time like worrying about how I was being perceived to total strangers, despite the fact that I thought that I was like smart enough to be him, you know, unaffected by it. But Mm. everyone's human. And I also just didn't understand that like there were people who like totally devoted their whole lives to like troll or not their whole lives, but their presence online was to like harass people that they found either odious or appealing or attractive or whatever. Yeah. I'm an old head. Like I kind of came into this a little bit ignorant and sort of thought I was doing one thing and and realized that it was being taken in this other way. But um, I'll say this. I haven't really talked about this on other interviews, but no, I mean, I lost my job based on a conflict that I had with someone around my feedback account, you know, like someone oh, who, okay. 
I'm not going to talk about what they did, but I'm going to talk about how I reacted and how that led to my losing my job. Like I would get into numerous conflicts with people pretty much daily, you know? Yeah, yeah. And most, most of the time I felt like I could either convince the person who I was in a conflict with that their initial impression to me was wrong. And that I'm actually someone who doesn't hate skateboarding and is not picking on people and whatever sort of problem someone may have with me. But I was not able to do that with this person. And on top of that, I was actively hostile to them, both privately and publicly, through my account. Okay. And they took the next step, which they saw fit, which was to contact my work and tell them that I had been using my private Instagram account to, like, bully people online. Which okay. wow. was a pretty far stretch, but from their perspective, like, that's what they felt. And that's how, you know, that was their truth, so mm -hmm. to speak. And so whether or not that was true, and from my perspective, that wasn't true, but my work had to take that accusation very seriously. Right. And they did what they had to do. And I, I'm, you know, like, I'm living in a world that sort of is the result of those consequences. Okay. Years later, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time chewing on that and being very, very upset with this person. And I think early on, I tried to sort of like apologize and take responsibility for it. But I, I don't think it was sincere because I was still very upset. Mm. But years later, I was luckily, I mean, by the grace of God or whatever, like that person reached out to me and apologized to me and sort of made an attempt to make amends. Oh, that's and nice. I cannot tell you how incredibly... Like, it doesn't matter who was right or wrong or what the circumstance... We were both in the wrong. You know, we were both yeah. adults, like, in the heat of an argument. But, like, it was so healing for, for me to... Relieving. To have, yeah. Yeah, just, like, just to realize that the person who had acted in this inhuman way, from my perspective, and also from their perspective, vice versa, was a vulnerable person who did not present their best self to me, and I didn't present my best self to them, and we are both living in a world where the consequences of that had, like, fucked up our lives. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh... There's a way to look at it as like unfair, but there's also a way to just be like, if you have the capacity to forgive someone and you can reach an understanding with them, like it doesn't matter who is right or wrong. Like, you know, would you rather like there's this like universal idea of justice or the human capacity to forgive and evolve? And I, mm. I kind of fall on the, on the latter end there. But like, yeah, that was, let's just put it this way. <laughs> when this thing that I thought was like not serious and was whimsical feedback like led to the most serious threat to my career and my livelihood yeah, yeah, yeah. that I had ever experienced. And it got a lot less fun to do that account. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Because all of a sudden I just, I mean, I was rightfully paranoid. I was like, what other terrible things could happen from this? And who else have I offended? And who else have I? What else could happen? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was lucky enough, like, again, like I, I had support from my friends. I had, there were other options for me to find work and make a life. But yeah, I mean, that, that side of my life came to a definitive end and it sort of hung on through the pandemic, but that account ended and all the data is gone. I don't know where it went at the end of 2020, which seemed fitting. <laughs> yeah. It was the end of a cycle. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit about hosting panel talks because I, I saw that you went to both editions of Pushing Borders back in yeah. 2018 and 2019. And you went also to the um, Slow Impact, the first edition of uh, Ryan Lay's event in Tempe, Arizona, which was a few months ago, I think in the spring. Yeah. And so you did three different panels on three different topics at all of these events. And um, I was wondering like how, how fun they were. And, and also, what was your experience of the latest one, Slow Impact? Because uh, I've been talking a little bit with um, some of the Pushing Borders guys, like uh, Sandra Holskins was mm -hmm. one of my mm -hmm. last interviews. And um, he told me that he wasn't the only person, of course, but he was part of the organizers of the first two editions. And he told me that it was a lot of work, a lot of stress. It was, of course, worth it, but it was quite hectic. And there were lots of, you know, panel talks organized, lots of side events and everything. And uh, yeah. it was a little bit overwhelming, at least for them to organize. And I was wondering, what was your experience, especially on uh, Slow Impact? Because uh, I, I saw some of the, like, especially the talk that you did with uh, Jerry Yasu and uh, Lurker Lou and everybody. Yeah. It seemed like it was a bit more relaxed, uh, a bit more easygoing than uh, maybe the rhythm that it was going at, at Pushing Borders. But what was your whole experience of uh, like both events? Yeah, well, I think each event was very distinct. 
The first Pushing Borders in 2018, I was very busy. This is, I was still working at the museum, I was still doing my feedback, and I was still writing my dissertation. So I was contacted by either Sander or Tom, someone in like, see if I'd want to be a part of this thing. And I was like, yeah, sure. And they're like, mm-hmm. you, would you want to like host the writing panel? I was like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, but like almost did no preparation because part of me sort of thought like I was like, I didn't take it very seriously. I'll just put it that way. I'll be completely honest. I was just like, okay, I was like skateboarding academia. Like how serious could this be? <laughs> like I'm nearly at the end of my academic studies and I have ne- no one I've encountered has studied skateboarding in this way. So the people who must be studying skateboarding in this way must not be serious skateboarders. I was still thinking about it like a bonehead, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. and um, I had a huge panel too. It was like my one critique of my panel that first year was that like, there were like maybe eight or nine people on my panel and it was everything from like nonfiction, memoir, academic, fiction. <laughs> like it was the whole gamut of writing Spectrum. and writing as a, yeah, like writing about skateboarding, writing about not skateboarding as a skateboarder, how we approach writing as skateboarders. Like it was, <laughs> it was very far reaching and it would have been, but it, it, was, it was, it was exciting. It, actually at that event, I was like, oh my God, there are people who are like really serious scholars who are diehard skateboarders who are taking skateboarding very seriously, but also like don't have this rigid idea of what skateboarding should be. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's coming out of like the groundbreaking work of like people like Ian Borden and Becky Beale and Ocean Howe. Mm-hmm. But um, I just, you know, that hadn't been my academic experience. So skateboarding had always been this sort of like hobby world of escape where I didn't have to take these big ideas that seriously into it. Yeah. So 2018, that completely changed my approach to skateboarding. Yeah. And I realized how important it was. And I started paying attention to like, you know, like Skate Like a Girl and like uh, Skate Pal and all these sort of NGOs and, and Skate After School, like what Ryan was up to. Mm-hmm. And then I realized then, I mean, in that year, I was like, oh, this really matters. And it is actually this like radical community of really serious people that are actually like minded. I just like didn't realize that I was involved in this in this way. Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe because that first event was I mean, I know how how Sander described it, but it was kind of small and it was sort of like it felt very quickly put together. The second one was like massive, (laughs) you know, and also like the the entire city of, of Malmo was, was like involved in it. And there were events all around the city. And there was like 150 people at the conference and probably like 60 people working as like volunteers or organizers. Oh, wow. And yeah, tears were shed. I mean, I had just lost my job. So I was so honored to be in the space where like I was invited. I was taken seriously. I was realized that what I was talking about or what I was in. I cried at every talk. <laughs> and it wasn't because okay. I was mourning losing my job. I was just like, I was so incredibly moved by seeing fellow skateboarders who were so committed to what they were doing. You know, being an academic teaches you this kind of, well, it's actually the same as being a skateboarder. You you learn this like commitment and this like devotion to ideas and to a certain practice. And I kind of realized that like, I'd never been able to fuse those two sides of my brain. Mm-hmm. But Going to the second one made me recognize that they'd been fused all along. I just had never realized it. Mm, okay, interesting. And so, so like I, yeah, I truly shed like tears of like joy and just appreciation and gratitude. I also just wasn't sleeping that well because Ted Schmitz was in my room and he's a maniac. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> okay, Ted Schmitz, who he's like one of the best skateboarders, gnarliest skateboarders I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. He works his ass off on on everything. He was able to get his trip paid for by agreeing to like produce and record and film like all of the events. So it was like oh, okay. he had all this camera equipment. He has all these friends. He is skateboarding all day and then like getting up at six in the morning after going to sleep at four in the morning to like record and be at every event. So his and my energy were very different. And like I was also just jet lagged and not sleeping. So that might have been why I was crying so much. (laughs) But no, I mean, you know, and the organizers, too, were they were just completely stretched in. The other thing, too, I think, is that the first one we we did keep it kind of you have to have some sort of academic credentials to participate in this or to be involved in it in an NGO. And I think the second one, they opened it up, which I think was very important, but it also meant that there were just so many more conversations and imperatives and kind of perspectives in that. Yeah. And for the most part, it was pretty harmonious, but there were moments when it was just like, 
how would a non-academic respond to like a very academic perspective in skateboarding? And it, I think a lot of the conflicts and a lot of the dissatisfaction that some people had came out of that. Just it was so big that it, it almost like imploded. But I wouldn't... Yeah, yeah. That's to say that I, I'm, I'm just speaking from the perspective of someone who knows that the organizers were really burnt out and stretched very thin mm-hmm. and they did a heroic job of pulling that thing off. But I, I would say that it just got very, very big. So to respond more directly to the third part of your question is about slow impact. Mm-hmm. I think Ryan and Mo, Mo is this professor from ASU, Maurice Crandall, who helped organize the thing. They both realized that um, if you had less events, that it would work better. So each each day at Slow Impact, there was one panel, usually in the morning, and then an organized skate event that you yep, could choose yep. to participate. Yeah, and, and that was it. And maybe something going on in the evening, like a, you know, a band or a, one of Kyle Bishi's reading things. Okay. But, you know, it was, it was no more than two things going on each day, and Tempe is fairly centrally, like, you can kind of get by on a bike or on foot, and so all the events were kind of clustered around the university or the skate after school offices by the parks, mm-hmm. and so it worked much better, you know? It was mellower, yeah. Yeah, but I, I still, you know, the, the panels were amazing, and I still found myself having these, like, moments of just, like, how lucky am I to be in this group of amazingly motivated people and, you know, like, I, I have friends outside of skateboarding, of course, and, mm-hmm, you know, I, sure. people I've been through graduate school with or just have known forever that I have a genuine connection to, but there's something so special about the kind of bonds you have with fellow skateboarders, you know, mm-hmm. and just, it's, a, it's like seeing a different iteration of yourself doing something that you never imagined you could do. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so I, I was so grateful to be included in that. I was just absolutely blown away by each one of my panelists, like responses, interest. You know, I mean, I, Jerry really opened up. It was yeah. so cool to like to have like a quasi like talk about his yeah. his practice and his like art and yeah for sure Lou and his whole thing and then Sam Corman's like mini lecture that he gave at the end was like I was like I've been waiting twenty years for someone to tell like to explain things the way that he's explaining like he's yeah, yeah yeah and so I just you know I mean I played a very small role in that just by being the moderator but I was so I was just like this is the fucking conversation I've been waiting for my whole life. You know, if I were in the audience, I would be just as thrilled, but this is, this is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it must've been super cool. It's just one of these things where like, by contrast, let me just put it this way. The last time I gave a, I delivered a paper act at an academic conference that was related to like my, the work I do on my dissertation. Right. It was in Atlantic city. I had to pay $150 to participate in it. I had to borrow a car to drive to Atlantic city, stayed in this skeezy hotel, didn't sleep very well. Cause I was nervous, delivered my paper to an audience of four people, three of whom were also the fellow panelists. No one was there. <laughs> and like the whole point of these conferences is that like you make contacts and you network and like people see your work and they care about it. But often what happens in an academic conference is that everyone's so worried about their own topic and their own paper and their own work that they, they don't pay attention to anyone else. Mm-hmm. And it's become a, another facet of like what's shitty about academia, which is that it's basically just a scam. People are just paying mm-hmm. money to, you know, to participate in these things that show no definitive like results in their in like furthering their career or helping them along whereas like these skateboarding conferences academic or not like we all have a genuine connection to this culture yes, and this exactly this yeah. thing and and like these things only enhance and only deepen our appreciation for what an amazing world we belong to in skateboarding and so I mean, maybe someone else had a different perspective, but I I just, I was so impressed by Sanders, like how he has been able to fuse like his academic work and his life as a skateboarder and Mm. all of the organizers and laborers who put those conferences together. I mean, it's incredible. If I'm not like moderating or a panelist, I will be in the audience. Yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. any and every pushing borders or slow impact that I can go to because there's probably nothing that touches on those two sides of my what I'm excited about in that. here and there your PhD and I know that you completed that recently but that you you had worked on it for a few years until right before you left uh, New York yeah 
So can you tell me a little bit about the topic of your PhD? I know it's about like two famous American artists. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. What a, it's always a, an honor to get to talk about my PhD in a skateboarding sure. centric podcast interview. But, um, well, the PhD program in art history is usually nine to 12 years. And I took a little bit longer because there were some speed bumps along the way, but I basically graduated. I started the program in 2010 and I, or 2009, and I successfully defended my dissertation and, and graduated in 2023. So almost 14 years. I will wow. say that my, my two friends, the ones that actually got me into being walking tour guides, Alice and Caroline, mm -hmm. Alice started a year before me, Caroline started a year after me, and we were all going to graduate the same at the same time. So these things happen. Oh, nice. Yeah, 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 for sure. But my topic was about the watercolors of Winslow Homer and John Singer Sargent, who are two Anglo-American artists that they painted when they visited Florida. They're from the 19th century, right? Like uh, yeah, end of the 19th. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so Homer spent most of his time in New England, mostly uh, Boston and New York and Maine. And John Singer Sargent spent most of his life in Europe, was born in Italy, studied in Paris and lived most of his life in London, but was nominally American. Mm -hmm. And both of them, I think watercolor is in a weird way, like both watercolor and fishing, which is a lot of what they painted, is a lot like skateboarding. Like it's sort of, there's the thing that you see that even if you don't paint watercolors, you can appreciate. And there's the things that you see that if you're a watercolor painter or an angler that adds another layer of meaning. In the same way that like outside audiences can recognize something cool about skateboarding, but practitioners like us will appreciate and understand skateboarding on an experiential level. And that will enhance the way that we sort of consume skateboarding. Mm -hmm. And so in a weird way, I was kind of like, I chose Florida because Florida is this kind of perpetual vacation destination full of fantasies. And it's a place where like anxieties and aspirations of European American identity were kind of projected onto it. So, you know, so mm -hmm. after the sort of like seminal wars and the removal and displacement of the indigenous communities of, of Florida, like Florida was kind of underpopulated and a lot of it was swampland and, you know, colonists and American North Americans didn't really know what to do with it. So they just kind of like build Mediterranean villas and tout Florida as like the sort of like the new American Riviera, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it's just this like awkwardly put together fantasy of like vacation, which I found very con in a weird way consonant with like the spaces that skateboarding takes place in, you know, mm -hmm. like the like California, Florida, Western Europe, you know, Mediterranean, Southern Europe, like sunny places where you can skate year round are places where skateboarding has really had occurred. Sure. And so in a weird way, I found that I was exploring ideas that obviously started through my interest in skateboarding in my dissertation. But I was also, you know, because I was writing about the 19th century, I'm writing about constructions of whiteness, about attitudes about slavery, about the Black Atlantic, the transatlantic slave trade, the tropics, American imperialism, and the way in which art kind of expresses and explores what's happening in this period. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it was one of these things where I also sort of realized that like skateboarding had taught me early on that I could try and fail and try and fall and just keep working and I would eventually pull it. And I think that was the most important lesson to have and the thing that really kind of kept me going as I was writing and working on my dissertation because it was just like, you know, no one is forcing me to do this. I'm doing this because I really care about it. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So but it's, it is an amazing relief to have it done. Yeah, I'm sure. So you, you just graduated, well, uh, I don't know if it's, you can say graduated, but you completed yeah. the yeah, yeah. PhD very recently, right? Like in June or May around there? Yeah, I, I graduated. And I, this is actually, now that you bring that up, the only time I'd ever felt as much joy, gratitude, and sincere happiness as I felt very naturally at Pushing Borders and Slow Impact was the graduation ceremony. Oh, yeah? Like, like the, the only time where I just felt like I was absolutely buzzing and, like, so profoundly happy was at that graduation ceremony. It was just, it was a good ceremony to just finish off that period of my life. But, um, yeah, that's to say that, like, perhaps what was so great about Pushing Borders and Slow Impact was that it was just this recognition of 
being part of a community that worked really hard to do this one thing, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) not that I need recognition, but just recognizing that I'm not doing it on my own, that I'm here with all these other people that that worked really hard. And this is our proof of it. Actually, Sander, uh, that I interviewed recently, also did a PhD that he completed a few years ago. I think it was about skateboarding in, in Korea, in South Korea. Yeah. And uh, I think he made a book out of that whole work. And I was wondering mm-hmm. if you were contemplating doing something similar, like uh, transforming it into something a bit more accessible in length or in size, or, you know, that could be understood by a wider audience, maybe people that are not necessarily as, you know, that don't have the knowledge that you have about art history and everything. Yeah, I think so. I mean, let me first say that I think that um, Sanders's book about skateboarding in South Korea is, by all counts, a much more important and necessary book than my book about 19th century watercolors in Florida. But um, <laughs> what you learn when you're doing academic work is to see how this very specialized thing that you're working on and you're interested in is the filter through which you can understand the rest of the world and the sort of big ideas that you're exploring actually apply elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I absolutely intend to turn my dissertation into either a book or a traveling exhibition with an exhibition catalog. I think what was very gratifying is, you know, it took me about seven years of working on this topic to see it to completion. But in those seven years, it never felt like my topic was irrelevant. Like it always felt Mm. like it gained new urgency and the things that were happening outside of my work were kind of helping me to think through what was going on inside of my work, if that makes any Mm. sense. Like, for example, like... um, It wasn't until, I mean, I was both Homer and Sargent painted Afro-Caribbean fishermen and laborers in Florida and the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And um, during the kind of BLM protests and like the riots and insurrections around police brutality in the United States after the murder of George Floyd, I was like, holy shit, I'm writing about the sort of roots of this attitude in America that is completely comfortable with seeing black suffering and accepts black abjection and desperation and almost aestheticizes it like this is where this is happening in this artist's work so i need to dive into that and figure that out you know Mm -hmm. so unfortunately i don't think that these issues are gonna be resolved or irrelevant anytime soon and i think that art offers one of the most compelling and interesting ways of exploring these ideas around culture so Yeah, I I definitely intend to turn this into an exhibition. I wrote my dissertation planning with imagining these paintings like in a space. But, you know, at the same time, the other side of it is, is that finishing a dissertation, no matter what it was on, just proves that it's a demonstration that you can work really hard and really intensely on a project and see it through. And the feeling of completion just, if nothing else, it just makes me realize that I can do other things too, (laughs) you know? Like, I'm so lucky to have like this world of skateboarding where if I just apply like a quarter of the discipline and rigor and effort that I put on my dissertation into this really rich world of skateboarding, like the results can not, I'm not saying that what I do will be amazing, but like skateboarding is such a ripe culture for analysis, for discussion, for conversation, for everything that we care about, like, Mm. you know, that I excited to sort of not approach it as an academic, because my whole point with academia, you know, my my teachers in undergrad made art history seem really, really exciting and really, really relevant. And they spoke about it in normal language. Yeah, it was accessible. Yeah, that board college students could not only understand, but be excited about. And that's always been my goal is to kind of democratize this information and make it like, I don't think that you need to get your PhD to like, learn about art. Like I think everyone, I think art should be accessible. You know, I'm happy to use my my training as an academic at the highest level to make a 12 year old appreciate art. After completing the PhD, since it's such a long period of time working on on a project, of course, you were doing a lot of stuff around that, not just that. But was there also a bit of a, I mean, I'm sure there was like relief and as you said, gratitude and happiness and everything. But was there a bit of a, not bitterness, but like kind of feeling a little bit bummed that, oh, it's this is over. Like what's next or something like that? Like, yeah, like uh, melancholy. Or yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Empty nest. Uh In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Like, I I definitely kind of miss looking with hungry eyes at the artists that I was looking at. Like, you know, every time I would travel across the country to see a Winslow Homer show or a John Singer Sargent show, and I would look for clues in the works that would, like, reinforce or contradict what I was writing about in my own work. Mm Mm-hmm. 
So I don't have that kind of desire right now as regards those artists. On the other hand, I always have three things happening at once. I'm always sort of working on three different projects. Okay. And I'm very grateful that as I was wrapping up my dissertation, that I was able to start work on the series that I'm doing for Thrasher. And also, I basically write essays for a gallery, a photo gallery in the Bay Area. So I kind of like... I'm happy to sort of let the dissertation and those ideas sit where they are for now and take some of that energy and, and work on these other two things happening. And so, like, yeah, if, if my dissertation were my only area of interest, like, I would be yeah. left right now. But luckily, it's just like, I already have this other thing going, and now I can really turn to that and, you know, see where that goes. And maybe that turns into a book, you know, yeah, and, yeah. or whatever. So, but the, it's a good question. And I think that there's always a feeling of empty nest once one project has flown the coop. <laughs> yeah, you're leaving behind something that you spent so many years, so many hours working on. And it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there must be a, a little bit of sadness, like leaving this behind. But there's also just this feeling of just great satisfaction. I'm just like, I don't even know if I'm right or wrong, but I'm, I was able to convince four people on my committee, the people yeah, who right, actually yeah. read my dissertation, that what I said is good enough to pass. So like now I can just have my weird ideas and have the PhD that demonstrates that I've expressed them clearly enough. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter if I'm right or wrong. Like <laughs> I did the thing, you know, it's like, yeah, 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 for sure. it's like when you, when you land your first kickflip, you're like, it may have been terrible, but I still did a kickflip, <laughs> you know, like, or when you, when you've learned to Ollie and you like, you know, you spend like a week with your back foot coming off or you're just nothing connecting. And then you did one and you're like, I got air. <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't matter how high the ollie was or how good the dissertation yeah. was. The point is, is I was floating there for a little bit and I, I rolled made away. It. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, yeah, actually, we mentioned it throughout our conversation, but uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about this whole ledge, of course. So yeah. as we were recording this just a few weeks ago, Thrasher released the pieces on uh, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. That were really cool. Really enjoyed those. And uh, I wanted to know, like, when did this project start? And did you approach Thrasher and pitch it to them? Or did they approach you and say, like, we'd love to do like something with these guidelines and you could be like the host kind of like, how, how did it all start? Um, well, I think it started first, uh, just over the last couple of years since I moved to the Bay Area, I ended up being like, oh my God, I'm like, I'm around all these legendary skate spots that a lot of skateboarders, but people of our generation, like grew up worshiping. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I realized that, you know, this, many of these spots were designed by very well-known architects and designers and artists, but not a lot had been written about this. And it, it all came, for me, the San Francisco thing kind of came out of like, I saw some old photo of Embarcadero and the obstacles weren't there. Like the C block and the, the seven, those ledges yeah, yeah. and steps were not there. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> I've always, you know, I kind of knew that Lawrence Halperin had designed it or, and Armand Valancourt had done the fountain in like the early 70s. But I was like, you see a photo from 1973 and those things are gone. So then it, I did a little bit of research and eventually found out that a guy named William Turnbull, who worked alongside Lawrence Halperin in many projects, added the sea ledge and the seven and all that stuff in the uh, stage in 1982. And then the, it all got taken out like, you know, within another two decades. And I was just like, there's this like amazing, like 30 year lifespan of this spot. Mm -hmm. And in 20 of those years, like this was the epicenter of modern street skating. Yeah, you know? exactly. So I, I did a lot of long form, probably annoying to read, like Instagram slide stories about that, where I could incorporate sort of images and text and video clips. Okay. But yeah, one one evening, Tony Vitello, who's, who's like, you know, the publisher of Thrasher, right. he's a friend of mine. I've, I've been, I've known him for five years. He and I, every now and then he'll like, I think he feels sorry for me. He'll like take me out to dinner and we'll go skating and stuff. Okay. I don't have a lot of friends in San Francisco, so he's taken me in. And we, we went to dinner downtown and we we're walking around California Street. And I was just kind of pointing out, I was like, you know, like this building was built then. And over here you have like, this is where Brown Marble was. And I mean, he obviously knows Giving all this him stuff. a personal tour guide. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's just, I fall into that, that mode naturally. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, uh, you know, within a couple of days, he, he was like, hey, call me. I, I have this idea. And he basically mapped it out, you know, and even down to the name. <laughs> Oh, and wow. uh, and it just felt like such a, I was like, yeah, of course I'll do this. Like, this sounds great. Mm. And it felt like such a kind of like, I'm really grateful to him that he sort of recognized that I nerd out about this stuff and that this would be the perfect kind of thing for me to work on. 
Absolutely, yeah. So it wasn't something that I pitched to them. It was absolutely something that was offered to me. Yeah, and um, that's amazing. Yeah, so it's been really fun. And I am I think I've watched each of the videos like once because I, I'm sort of embarrassed about, like with anything, once you watch something, you're like, oh, I wish I'd said that. Or, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. you know, like I, I said, when I'm talking about Drake Jones's Switch 360 hoop, I say he landed it away perfectly and I meant rolled away perfectly. So uh, okay. ironically, like I describe his perfect landing imperfectly. Mm. But I think it's just, you know, it's, other people have done videos about spots. There's obviously like a, there are precedents here, but it's um, sure. something that I have, I feel somewhat uniquely poised to do. Like I'm, yeah, yeah, I have yeah. the sort of like training as an academic to do the research. Yeah. I have the background as a lecturer and tour guide to be able to tell these stories. And I have the lifelong devotion as a skateboarder to being able to explore why these spots matter to us. Right. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's a lot of fun. And so when Tony talked to you about this, how long did it take to work on this first uh, series? And did you decide, okay, we're going to do San Francisco for now and see how this works out? Or did you already think, okay, we'll do SF, maybe New York City, I don't know, LA? Yeah. I mean, potentially this could be a, a global project and everything. But like, did you first say, okay, let's let's just do maybe the few iconic spots of San Francisco and we'll take it from there? Or... Yeah, I think I think that um, you know, San Francisco is our like our pilot series, you know, where where it's in Thrasher's backyard. Yeah. I live here. It's also so recognizable that, you know, we're going to see like if this if this is going to work, we have to try it out here. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, from the first talks we had uh, with Tony and Cole, we just thought about where we could take this, you know, he, like St. Paul's in London, like Bastille in Paris, like Le Dome, yeah. like all, you know, like Hotel de Ville in, in Lyon. Like yeah, there's yeah, just yeah. all these amazing ledge plazas and these amazing overlaps of like skateboarders because these places were so important because of videos and photos that like jb skating pier seven you know mm -hmm. like just imagine or stevie skating pier seven like jb who grew up skating hdv and stevie who grew up skating love park like how those skaters came from across the country and across the globe to skate this one spot that story just seems so interesting to me because i sure you know it's also of an era and it's very much like an era that was important to me just based on how old I am, but it's also just sort of explaining why certain spots endure or survive in the imagination as like epic spots. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because Thrasher did publish a book called Epic Spots, so we can't call it that. But mm -hmm. um, I've filmed a bundle in another city. I'm trying to be a little bit coy about it because like, I'm not sure when this podcast will release, but I'm not sure when these videos will get done. We definitely okay. worked on the first four in various iterations over about six months. I think from the first meetings with Tony and Cole in the fall of 2022 to my first attempts at self-filming them on my phone, like feedback, <laughs> which totally sucked to like <laughs> us realizing like, oh, we need a filmer. We need to get Brendan Bill in here to shoot me and shoot B-roll. We need Doug like in the office to like help animate. We need Tom the archivist to help with all the whole you know, production. Like, yeah. Yeah. Which actually is such a, it's such a relief. Like after running this stupid account, feedback account on my own and like bearing the brunt of all the criticism and praise or whatever, like it's so nice to sort of have the infrastructure of the last kind of major biggest media production company in skateboarding and their archives and kind of depth of knowledge. Like it's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And so this other city that you shot in, I'm not going to ask you where it is, but can you tell me if it's in the U.S. or is it abroad? Yes, it's in the U.S. And let's just say that I absolutely have plans to go abroad with it. And, you know, I, I mean, the other great thing about this, like any project, is it's obviously a collaboration with other people, you know, like I, mm -hmm. yeah. I rely on the, the expertise of, of locals and people who are actually central to that scene. You know, it's my job to kind of call it all together into like a snappy seven minute story. But um, yeah, it must be hard to uh, do a piece on EMB and bring it down to seven minutes. That must be quite yeah. challenging. Like, uh... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm sure that Brendan filmed about, you know, 90 minutes of me talking about Embarcadero <laughs> the day that we went out filming and he, he whittled it down to seven minutes. And I think like an Embarcadero, I relying on like metaphor or analogy often helps tell the story. Like it helps get the big idea. Like, so with Embarcadero it's just like, you point out the pock marks from people's axles on the bricks. Oh, yeah. And then you tell the story about Shel Silverstein's giving tree and you kind of have the thematics of 
why this spot is important and why it's still appealing. And you don't have to talk about every trick that Henry Sanchez did, as much fun as it would be at yeah. Embarcadero. Or, like, mm. you know, I mean, there, it's important for me to, like, you could do a longer documentary, but if you did a longer documentary, you'd have to talk about every single trick ever done and, like, all the other stuff. And, and I think keeping it, like, less than 10 minutes helps to say, hey, we're going to tell you why this spot matters and we're going to use some archival footage to illustrate this, but it's not going to be an exhaustive... Like, I, I rewatched the, like, Hubba hideout on video, for example, and I was oh, just yeah, like, this, yeah. like, this is awesome. I love hearing, like, Jason Dill talk about why Hubba hideout matters, and he's got such a great mind for that sort of thing, but he also mm-hmm. said, you know, this is our, like, big O, this is our upland or whatever. Like, you always need those sort of metaphors. And Sure, yeah, yeah. So I, let's just put it this way, as a hint. I had a lot more to say about the history of the city where we filmed after the first bundle of San Francisco, and I do not envy Brendan's task of having to edit (laughs) hours and hours of material that I had down to a snappy, you know, seven or eight minutes. Uh But yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, if I can sort of find that one emblem, that one kind of like either story or analogy or just feature of the spot that can stand for something bigger, that's, that's the goal with all of these, you know? And so Brendan is uh, the guy who films and edits the pieces, right? Yeah, Brendan, Bill, and Doug. I, his last name is Polish, and I can't remember it. I'm sorry. Doug, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> They're my two-point guys. I mean, they're, they're the ones who literally polish the turd of, of me. <laughs> <laughs> but like, for example, uh, when you went to EMB, let's say, did you kind of uh, write down what you were going to say? Did you have like a script of some sort? Or did you prepare in advance? Or were you like, okay, let's just uh, go there, and I'll kind of improvise based on what I'm going to see? How did you work on that? So the Embarcadero one, we kind of knew that Embarcadero had to be like the first one. And so I definitely, in an earlier iteration, it was going to be like a voiceover documentary style thing where I was like, I had written a script and I would just read that over footage and photos, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so I did have a script and I had kind of labored over that script for maybe six weeks or something. But um, no, when we showed up there, it was I didn't look at the script. I was just like, I'm going to sort of let it's like giving a tour in a museum or actually lecturing. Like you, you sort of, you're in the space, you're looking at the thing, you know, you've done your work and you're excited about the place. So you kind of let the features of the place prompt you to explain them. You know, Mm -hmm. I guess it is training that I've had as an art historian where you'll be in a museum with your students and you kind of know what you want them to learn, but then you'll see new things or they'll make an observation that like, adds to your understanding and appreciation of the work of art and it's a similar thing like and brennan's very good he'll he'll sort of be like well maybe you should like say have you thought about talking about it like this or point out this thing you know like Mm. like just he was the one who made the observation like i'd spent all this time talking about like the bridges that connected the embarcadero center to the alcoa plaza and he was the one who was like well it's pretty crazy that the only bridge that they knocked down was the hubba hideout bridge and i was like oh yeah (laughs) you know Mm. um so there have been a couple times where we've gone to spots and like i either had too much of a script in it and it just didn't work and so i just were like let's freestyle it or i end up talking about something that i had no idea that i was going to talk about like when we were at pier 7 i was like i don't know for whatever reason it was on my mind but i just sort of thought i had the analogy that it was like seeing your high school sweetheart who like now has plastic surgery and has been married a couple times and <laughs> you oh, can yeah. still rec- recognize what you loved about them but it's like it ain't pretty <laughs> it ain't the same yeah for sure <laughs> yeah i mean that those are the sort of things that sign it kind of come spontaneously and it seems like those are also the sort of things that people respond to most positively because it yeah it is like it's a sincere response to a to a place and you're kind of figuring it out as you go along yeah well i look forward to these other pieces that you're working on man. thank you can't wait to see them can we expect maybe some new ones before the end of the year or oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i think i mean i don't want to reveal too much about our production schedule sure, sure. because i'm of course i'm a little bit i mean you know but i i think it's basically like we release one e- a week for about a month and then we kind of are working on the other bundle that next month maybe two months You know, so it's like, it's an ongoing thing. It's not seasonal, but it is like, yeah, each city or each spot will kind of get its own little bundle. Okay. So yeah, but it also means like, you know, I'm gonna, the book isn't closed on San Francisco. Like, obviously, you know, you can talk about Brown Marble, Wallenberg, Union Square, like all these other places. And since we're in San Francisco, I think there'll be a little bit of a bias because it's just so easy to shoot here and there's so much history. But no, I mean, Philadelphia, D.C., 
Paris, Lyon, like Barcelona is a huge one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, like Barcelona. How how do you pick four spots in Barcelona? <laughs> I mean, exactly. And and then also like which one is like the emblematic spot? You know, it just depends on the era. But um, Magba, I guess for Barcelona, maybe. Sure. Yeah. That's debatable, but yeah. Right or or Sans. I mean, you know, like yeah, yeah. You listen to Josh Kalis, and he likes Machba fine, but he thinks Sans is the real plaza. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 What's cool is it just always depends on the era, you know, like like any city, any spot, any scene, like skateboarders will privilege one spot over another just depending on how accessible it is and the environment, mm. the setting. So Very cool. Well, can't wait to see those new ones, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, they're fun to work on. I usually wrap up my interviews with one question for me before we do the friends questions, and that's basically what's, according to you, the most valuable lesson that you've learned from skating. And uh, of course, it's not just the act of skating, it's everything that goes around it. So what's like maybe one valuable life lesson that you've learned from all these years around skateboarding? I think it's, it's more like a word or an idea than a lesson, but it's impermanence. You know, that um, early on, you learn that your skateboard is going to get thrashed and chipped and fucked up. And you learn to embrace that. Because if you don't embrace that, then you're, you're going to be embalming your skateboard and you're not really going to be skateboarding. Right. And yeah. similarly, you learn that your body is going to get hurt and your brain is going to evolve and change and morph and that nothing should be fixed, that you can't hold... You can't hold these things like to be precious and, you know, like undisturbed. And that's an important thing that mm -hmm. skateboarding teaches us to embrace change and to embrace impermanence. And I think that that's the best way to move through life. Mm -hmm. I think we learn these things early on. And if you approach it in the right way, that's, I think, the most sane and most healthy way to live your life. Go it's through just, life, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, is to embrace impermanence, which means like fully commit and fully engage with what you're doing when you're doing it but know how to let it go as well you know you can only have one one favorite board at a time and that's the time that you're skating it and once you're done done skating it unless you're a weird wall hanger it's probably garbage and meaningless you know <laughs> yeah 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 And that also just means, like, as I get older, I was down in L.A. like this weekend and I have heel spurs and I could barely slappy. And I was just like, God, this sucks. But it still is like, yeah, I have to accept that I'm just not I'm losing my power and my sort of capability and my coordination. And I'm yeah, still cool. Or maybe with you it. were just having a bad day. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. But like it, it, just even that, just like accepting having a bad day. Like we've had so many bad days in skateboarding and we still love it. Okay, well, let's wrap it up with uh, some of these friends' questions. So, All right, I'm approaching with trepidation. <laughs> so I'll have you listen to this first one. Hi there, Ted. One of the things I really love about your work, and in particular with this old ledge, is how you connect all of these familiar historical elements of skateboarding, from the skateboarders to the skate spots and the tricks done at them, to the architectural history of the city itself, which I think provides really fascinating and important context that we don't often see. Is there anything else that you think would add extra definition to skateboarding's history when explored in a similar way? Whether that's looking at the impact of municipal politics, music, or what have you on skating? I can almost guess who that is, but I'm not sure. Okay. I know that's not the question, but is that, is that Cole? Yes, yes, exactly. Oh, wow. Cole nice. Nowicki, yeah. You know yeah, shout out to Cole. Wow, okay. I may not be able to do that for everyone, but um, thanks, <laughs> Cole. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think... Any lens is a great way to approach skateboarding, but to specifically answer that question, I was, I've been really thinking a lot about music. Mm -hmm. I had this conversation with Lee Smith, kind of like as a background interview to Pier 7, and we were j both talking about how when we first heard Wu-Tang Clan, you know, like it sounded like nothing we'd ever heard before. Mm -hmm. And like I'm experiencing this in central Texas and he's experiencing this in San Francisco. And like you had to like rewind and listen to it. And I was just thinking about how like technical street skating and the type of skateboarding that Lee was actually involved in. It had such a close correlation to what hip hop was doing at that moment, you know, mm, and, and yeah. that's not to say that you couldn't be into like other music and skate like that. But it between like dressing dope and dressing kind of hip hop and like just the whole thing, like 
Yeah, I think like they're really close parallels and a lot more work needs to be done. And I think Jose Vadi, actually this writer who you should absolutely have on the show, he explores the relationship between music and skateboarding with a greater depth and, and kind of sensitivity than I would ever be capable of. But I think like not enough has been written, said or considered when it comes to thinking about how music impacts skateboarding. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm not the person to do it, but I that would be a, another absolutely like the culture, you know, like the sort of like, I think skateboarding and hip hop in a lot of ways, like they sort of parallel one another, but also yeah, just yeah. like they both reach these, have these sort of similar golden eras and blow up and become mainstream under very similar circumstances as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess the short answer is just music. I wish I knew more about it and I wish I could be that person. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Cole. Okay, this next one is from Ted Schmitz. Oh, shit. So Ted asks a few things, but uh, maybe we can just do one of these questions. I'll read them all to you and you can pick the one you want to answer. Okay. The first one is, what happened when you visited the Gons Curb during the forest fire hazy day in New York City? <laughs> Second one is, how do you feel about the idea of the city resurfacing Tompkins or adding ramps? And the last one is, should someone aging gracefully as a skater get more into transition or curbs? Hmm. I'm going to answer the first and third. Okay. So what happened during the Gons Curb incident in New York City was, uh, Jesus. <laughs> I was with Ted, and Ted's a great photographer, but he wastes his photographic talents on me skating curbs, which <laughs> should answer the aging gracefully <laughs> question about <laughs> curbs or transition. And so he was setting up First, I should just say that like coming back to New York City this summer was the first time I that I felt like this wasn't my home and that I had either moved on from many of the ideas or was simply just like many of the things that were happening in the city no longer applied to me. And I also felt it like had a different energy. Like it's New York is a little bit more wild and kind of dangerous after 2020, I think, than it was before. Okay. Or maybe I've just lost the code. But anyway... So we're, we're setting up to shoot a frontside slappy <laughs> okay. and uh, at that curb that, that Gons always skates in right, Battery yeah, Park. Yeah. And this guy comes over to Ted and he's like talking to Ted and he's kind of in his face. And he, he, the guy looks a little bit, a little off. And I can sort of tell by Ted's body language that um, like this guy is just like making him feel uncomfortable or whatever. I mean, I could just sort of tell that like the dude's like not picking up on social cues. Okay. And so I walk over and I'm like, I'm like, what's up, man? And he's like, you guys are brothers, aren't you? And I was like, no, we're not brothers. Like we have the same first name, but not the same last name. And I'm making a joke. And he's like, he's like, don't play with me. You guys are brothers. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not, man. I promise you, like if we were, I'd tell you, I'd, I'd be proud to have this guy as my brother. And then he kind of follows me back to where I'm skating or starting. And he's like, look at your eyes. <laughs> He's like, you guys are brothers. And I was like, we're not. And he's like, you should treat people how you want to be treated, motherfucker. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. Okay. Like, the vibe just shifted. And yeah. uh, and I'm like, I am, man. Like, we're just trying to skate, have a good time. Like, I hope you're d- doing all right. Like, whatever. Keep it moving. I, didn't, I mean, I don't think I said keep it moving, but I'm just like, kind of yeah. just trying to be assertive and also not trying to have a Diffusing conflict. Using the, yeah. Yeah. And he's like, I will slap the shit out of you. And I was yeah. like, I hope you don't. He walks across the street and he's kind of muttering to himself. And I do a couple slappies, whatever. And then next thing you know, he's like running back over towards me, screaming, you think I'm playing? You think I'm playing? He throws his bags down and takes a swing at me. Wow. <laughs> and I, I haven't been like punched on the street like ever. Certainly not in the yeah. 18 years that I lived in New York and definitely not in like the three years that I've lived in San Francisco. Although this sort of thing is more prone to happening in San Francisco. Next thing I know, like the skateboards in my hand and I'm kind of holding the trucks and like the board as like a shield slash weapon. And Ted runs over. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then like this dude's like yelling and I'm yelling. And I, I mean, I don't remember this totally clearly, but I just kind of think at a certain point I'm like, okay, this dude's obviously totally crazy. This has nothing to do with me or Ted yeah. or anything. Like we just happen to be in his space. And if I keep yelling aggressively, like this is just going to escalate. So at a certain point, I'm like holding the skateboard and I'm like, are you all right, dude? Mm. <laughs> and, and he's like, you know, like I'll punch you in your throat. And I was like, I really hope you don't, dude. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he's just like kind of goes back to his stuff and picks it up. He's still like kind of like muttering and threatening, but he's it's not going to escalate. Okay. And it just, I don't know. I mean, it, again, it wasn't like, uh, this sucked. It sucked for him. It yeah, sucked for yeah. us. Like, 
Luckily, like it didn't accelerate past that because why should it have? But it was just like a rude awakening where I was just like, okay, like no matter how long I've spent in New York and how street smart or savvy I think I am, like all that bullshit I just told you about being a tour guide and having eyes <laughs> on the street, none of that matters when like you're sharing you space with some the psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, he was just, he obviously had some sort of like mental health issues and yeah, 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 probably, whatever, yeah. but just like the other alternative of like me doing anything with that skateboard against him, that sucks. Or like him, like hitting me or like whatever, like mm-hmm. that also sucks. Like, so it was a very humbling kind of weird encounter to have, but I guess in a weird way it, it ended as best as it possibly could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's... It wasn't like a life changing event, but it was just like, you know, like, okay, like no matter how this was the month that I was like, had this wonderful graduation. It's like no matter who you are, what you're doing or where you are in your life, like chaos happens and you just have to kind of roll with it. Yeah. Wow. Pretty scary. (laughs) Great great question, Ted Schmitz. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for revisiting that trauma. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Okay. The next one is from uh, Brendan Bill. Ah, so, shit. <laughs> he said, what's the best spot along the Embarcadero in 2023? And he also asked, what Embarcadero spot do you have a physical piece of? <laughs> <laughs> um, the best spot for me along the Embarcadero is the very shitty ledge behind the fountain that, as far as I know, I'm the only one who actually enjoys skateboarding. <laughs> it's about 10 inches high. It's slanted. It has a limited run up. And the challenge of skating that ledge for me is like very, very rewarding to just do tail slides on. So my personal take is, yeah, it's the ledge behind the fountain at Embarcadero, kind of mm-hmm. the newer part of it. Okay. And uh, yes, I, uh, I guess I can cop to this here. I physically removed two of the glass blocks of the bay blocks while filming our episode there because they were, you can easily just pry them off and people had already taken them. And that spot, that art installation piece of outdoor art is severely compromised anyway by the skate stoppers and all the vandalism. So I was like, you know, I like these two glass blocks and Mm. my partner likes them in our house. So here they are. (laughs) And it's also, you know, like it's a relic. It's, it's part of an era and part of a spot and part of a city that I care a lot about. So I have no qualms about that. I hope I don't get arrested for admitting that. (laughs) Okay. The next one is from Farron Golding that I had on the podcast not long ago. Oh yeah. So he said, which famous spot is so hard to skate in terms of basically being a bad spot that he or you are surprised it went on to become as notable as it has? Hmm. That's a good and challenging question. Um, I would say generally that most of the spots in San Francisco are a lot harder to skate than they look. And that partly has to do with just the air and the weather and the kind of how rugged they are. Mm -hmm. So I think like maybe it's amazing that Hubba Hideout had the life that it's had because that was a very challenging place to skate. Whereas like when you go to like LA or a lot of European plazas outside of London, because I think all of London is really hard to skate. Um, But, uh, you know, a lot of these other like iconic plazas and skate spots are a lot more easy to skate than the places you go to in San Francisco. And I'm not being chauvinistic there. I'm just saying like New York's way easier to skate than than san francisco so i would i guess i'm gonna just be kind of basic old head and say hubba hideout even though it's gone mm. and probably with respect to farron's work i w- it looks like those vicky benches were really hard to skate they're like high and short and kind of the, oh, the you know the ones that lucian Cl- the, the latest piece he did for quarter snatch? yeah yeah that looked like a very challenging and amazing place to skate and he did yeah. such a great job on that segment Okay, next one is from, I'm not sure how to say his name, Louis Sarowski, at Lurker Lou. Yeah, Lurker Lou, yep. Sarowski, sorry for butchering your name, Louis. He's used to it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Uh, so he said, where is his short and wide aesthetics chain t-shirt? That's my only question. <laughs> Uh, that motherfucker. Yeah, he, he once, like, about 10 years ago when I was feeling not so comfortable about skating with other people, he was like, he's like, don't take this the wrong way, dude, but every one of your shirts fits like it's too short and too wide for you. Uh, so... <laughs> But don't take this the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to insult you. But that's that's Lou's charm. Right. Uh, my aesthetics chain T-shirt is in a box in a closet in my mom's house in Berkeley. I still have that thing, and it rules. <laughs> but yeah, 
Before I moved to New York, I, I was friends with like the team manager of aesthetics at the time, this guy Barrett, and a few of my friends were like either had been on flow or were on flow for aesthetics. So okay. I showed up to New York City with like just a bevy of the coolest aesthetics gear that ever existed in the golden era of that company. So I think I was kind of known for having some kind of wild aesthetic stuff in the era of 2002, 2003, because that was probably my, the last company that I really gave a shit about. Okay, uh, next one is from Michael Burnett. Oh, no. He always asks weird but fun questions. So he said, who is the greatest Texas vert skater and who is the greatest street Texan? Um, I mean, I think it would please Michael Burnett for me to say someone like Craig Johnson or John Gibson. But unfortunately, I wasn't around for those guys. So I would, I'm going to go with like Mike Crum. Okay. Mike Crum was one of those skaters who, who was able to kind of bridge what was amazing about street skating in the early 90s with vert skating, a lot of like nollies and switch pop shovets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Those Dallas guys had like, Dallas and Houston, they had pretty heavy vert scenes, whereas Austin sort of suffered after Lone Star. So I'm going to say Mike Crum for vert and greatest street Texan. Um Zach Martin would be like the best all around skateboarder out of Austin. Dude, that's a hard one. Because think about it. I'm just going to like list a few people. Jake mm -hmm. Nunn, Forrest Kirby, Dana Gonzalez, Anthony Correa is an honorary Texan, mm -hmm. and Zach. So I'm going to take the easy way out, and I'm going to say John Burpee, who's an Austin, Texas legend that no one else knows about. So I'm going to say and he's mostly a ditch skater. John Burpee okay. is the greatest Texan. Only a few Texans will appreciate that. And hopefully Michael Burnett as well. Right. Oh, honorable mention goes to Richard Angelitas, too. But there we go. Oh, I didn't know he was from Texas. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So then I have one from Sloan Loritz. Is that how you say his name? Oh, Sloan. Yeah, Loritz. Yeah. So basically, he wanted me to ask you about this NYC-based message board called Metrospective. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay. Like it was before the slap message board, but a similar kind of thing. And uh, he told me that you were impersonating like a French skater who would come to New York City and like uh, talk about his misadventures and people would like give him advice or whatever. <laughs> I yeah. thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Sure. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Well, let me just add some historical context, which I think we've already covered, which is that I moved to New York in the wake of a very disappointing experience of attempting to live in Paris and attempting to kind of fully immerse myself in the French skateboarding world. Right, right. Yeah. And I think I must have like vectored that trauma and that disappointment through the <laughs> invention of like a, yeah, an imaginary kind of French tech skater who wore swishy pants and like action shoes Kind of, you know, mm -hmm. like a Lacoste hat or something. Like your Flo Marfang or your JB oh, Jays yeah. or Frank Baratario, like that type of skater. Right, right. But yeah, it was sort of like chronicling my own misadventures in downtown New York and vectoring it through this like made up persona of this French guy that I would like, you know, yeah, I would talk about all the tricks I was doing at like the <laughs> TF in downtown and then all the kind of strange social interactions I was having and It's kind of like Feedback TS where, yeah, where like, yeah. I, I didn't actually know that people were taking it seriously. But it was also, it was still in this period of like anonymous message boards where like everyone was posting under a different handle, like no one was themselves. Right, yeah. And so like, yeah, it seemed pretty, uh, <laughs> seemed like a, <laughs> a worthwhile project. I, I forgot his name. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you remembered, but okay. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's so funny to think about, like, the skate scene in New York in 2002 is actually pretty small. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, not a lot of people were, like, moving to New York at that moment for skateboarding or to be involved in skateboarding. Right, and yeah. so I, I'm not going to say I made a big splash, but it was fairly easy to kind of figure out that there were, like, you know, everyone skated Tompkins or skated Flushing. And then, you know, you would do a little loop downtown or a loop up to Midtown. But otherwise, everyone was kind of, like, talking about skateboarding on these message boards. So mm. I thought I, I would fuck with that a little bit. Okay, next one is from Aaron Meza. Shit. So he said, Ted, if you had one ledge to skate for the rest of your life, currently skatable or lost in the sands of time, which ledge would it be and which three skaters would you have at every session? And then bonus question, which famous architect has been the most prolific at creating the most skatable spots? Cool. Great question. Jesus Christ. You can tell. He why always has great, great questions. Yeah, he's brilliant. Um, I would say brown marble and I would want to skate brown marble with Rick Ibiceta. <laughs> Because I, I just think he was like an early pioneer of, of skating brown marble. 
Eric Pupecki for his Frontside 180 Fakie 50 alone. Mm-hmm. And um, Mike Carroll for his Nolly Flip Backside 50 50 trick tip for the 4 in 1 on Brown Marble. Mm-hmm. And, uh, okay. and I think in an indirect way, Mies van der Rohe is the architect who is like single handedly responsible for the design of most of the legendary skate plazas or like perfect marble benches. Like, whether he had a direct hand in it or not, I mean, he definitely designed a few very important plazas in like Chicago and Toronto that have been long standing spots. Okay. His like designs have influenced the people that designed Love Park, Pulaski, like kind mm. of any major like ledge plaza in the United States and probably in Western and Eastern Europe and Uh extending it into Asia. Like I think it's Mies all the way. He kind of came up with the aesthetics of like corporate modernism that has been imitated for 80 years. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I'll look him up. uh, What was his name again? Mies van der Rohe. He was a German architect who came to the United States. He designed the Barcelona pavilion uh, in 1929. And that's, as far as I'm concerned, it's the first like marble slab ledge that was probably not ever skated because it was torn down in, after six months and then rebuilt in the late 80s. But um, I think that design sort of impacted like everyone else. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, all right, let's do the next one. This one is an audio one. Salut, Beyond Board. Salut, tout le monde. J'ai des questions pour Ted. Excuse-moi, Professeur Ted Barrow. Hello, everybody. I got a couple of questions for Professor Ted Barrow. Ted, hard-hitting question for you, homie. At what point does skate nostalgia, more specifically the consumer-driven skate nostalgia, eBay, Instagram sites devoted to old clips, old catalogs, at what point does this become destructive for skateboarding and skate culture? Or is it a positive? And what's your favorite company that nobody remembers? So I got two for you. J'en ai deux. Okay. I think skate nostalgia fuels a lot of the skate industry now. So yeah. I don't think that it's necessarily destructive for the culture of skateboarding or the industry of skateboarding. I would argue you could say that this old ledge <laughs> is, <laughs> is, you know, a form of skate nostalgia. Sure. But I think it's, um, like I said, there's good nostalgia and there's bad nostalgia. There's the nostalgia that's reactionary and conservative and doesn't want and resists change. Mm -hmm. And then there's the type of nostalgia that hopefully that I experience where I just sort of see the significance of the past and and hope that it enhances my experience in the present and moves me forward into the future. You know, in other words, like, I don't want things to go back to the 90s. I'm just glad that the 90s happened. Mm -hmm. And I think like... I mean, I think most old heads know about this company, but I always liked Mad Circle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, that was an incredible team and just an incredible era in skateboarding. And I liked the way that Justin Gerrard kind of mixed, like, the street sort of, like, hip-hop graffiti stuff coming out of, like, Underworld Element and Giant at the time with, like, the sort of arty stereo video, like, San Francisco beatnik thing, especially in Let the Horns Blow. And also Mad Circle just had an insane team. You know, anyone from like Spencer Fujimoto and Marcus McBride and those early ones, Mike Ko, Moses at Conan to, you know, Rob Welch. Paul Salve was on there for a minute. Yeah, Yeah. Pontus, Scott Johnson, Carl Watson, Bobby Coolio. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mad Circle is pretty dope. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, if I want like a digging in the crates one, uh, there's a company called like Number Nine that like Frank Gerwer skated for. They were out of Long Island. They were really dope too. Okay, what kind of a brand was it? Like clothing or? No, it was a board brand. It was like an East Coast, you know, I think they had Chapman Wood. It was like, a, it was around 95. And, and I think Frank's like first real part where he's still in New York, he, I think it was called Number Nine. That was a really dope company. I haven't heard about that one. Okay. And um, I also appreciate, I know who that was. That was obviously Patrick. Yes. I appreciate Patrick speaking French with me, and I made the mistake of uh, telling him that I was adept in French, like at Slow Impact, and then he and another Francophone friend of his kind of cornered me at this party and just started speaking French to me, and I could fully understand, but the moment I opened up my mouth in response, I could just tell they're like so disappointed in how (laughs) shitty my French was. (laughs) So... uh, Thank you, Patrick, and I'm sorry. My French sucks. I'm sure. I'm sure you just need to practice a bit more. Maybe a couple of beers will loosen you up, and yeah. the French will come flowing back. A demi pêche or two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This next one is from Josephine. Your uh, oh my girlfriend? god, my partner. Yeah, yeah. Yes. 
Uh-oh. So she said, what was your first revelatory art experience and how old were you? That's a good question. And so it's weird that I don't have an answer, but I think I was 19 years old and I was visiting Occidental, my college, as a prospective student. And I sat in on a class that was being taught by the person who had become my advisor. And he was lecturing about Italian mannerism. And I looked, I mean, again, I'm 19. I'm from central Texas. I'm in LA. It feels very glamorous. And I feel like I'm in a room full of adults. Mm -hmm. And this person gives the best lecture I've ever heard. That's absolutely engaging and really fascinating. And I'm looking around and there's, you know, art history classes are mostly female at the time. So I was like, I was like, wow, like there are like these beautiful, sophisticated, women in this class there's this really articulate and fascinating lecture and the art itself is like nothing i'd ever seen on the screen and i was just like i need more of this you know like Mm. so i think that would probably you know there are numerous things that led up to that but i think like that was a moment where i was like i want to do more of this yeah yeah and it's kind of funny because it's like it wasn't a direct encounter with a work of art because i was in a lecture i was but it's sort of like um you know, as skateboarders were so attuned to like being really excited at a video premiere and seeing a, a skate video for the first time. It was sort mm-hmm. of like that. It was like I was I was seeing a skate video for the first time and I wanted to learn more about skateboarding. Okay, I just have a few last ones. So this one is from Aaron Zott. Is that how you say his name? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he said, was there ever a time when you could have switched back tailed an entire ledge at the Staten Island ABC ledges or whatever they're called? Mm-hmm. And then he asked also, and have you ever been paid to model? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just say barely yes to the last little clause of his question and say no more. Okay. And um, the story that Aaron tells, I don't quite remember it this way, but I'm just going to tell the story the way Aaron remembers it, is that um, we went to the ABC ledges at Staten Island, and this is probably like 2004. Mm-hmm. I think we were with Lurker Lou, Ian Reed, maybe... Funnily enough, Eli Reed as well. No relation. Okay. And we get there and there's these Jersey guys there. And it's like Steve Durante and Brian Wenning and maybe oh, wow. Don Law. Yeah, yeah. Damn. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and Aaron had been in, in New York for a few years before I went over. So he like goes over and says, what's up to Wenning? Because he knows him, I guess, from uh-huh. Seaport days. And um, I don't know Wenning. But at this point, I filmed my Lurkers 2 part where I switched backside tail slid the grade at Flushing. Mm-hmm. And oh, again, yeah. this is one of these things, like maybe it's like a dick move, but I was like, Wenning had already done it. He did it in his photosynthesis part. I wasn't trying to like one up him. I wasn't trying to do better. Like I'm not even sponsored. I have no skin in this game. I just like switch backside tail slide over the grate was something that I could do at the time. Sure, like, yeah, yeah. And you know, like I'm not trying to like make a career out of this, but I could tell that there was some kind of like Wenning was a little bit like, yo, who the fuck's this guy? Like when I show oh, up yeah, at the... Yeah, okay. You know, and so they weren't really skating. And I just decided to like, I was just going to do a switch backside tail side across one of the whole ABC <laughs> ledges. Okay. Like from end to end as far as I could go. And I don't know if this, I mean, it's probably also just because I didn't have that many tricks and that was the only thing I could do that would be even good. But like Aaron thinks that I was doing that to sort of assert my dominance <laughs> in, <laughs> in the field of switch backside tail slides against a fellow switch backside tail slider. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I landed it. I don't think, I don't even know if I was like doing it that way. I think maybe I was offering like, it was like a peace offering. It was like, you may be pissed at me because I did your trick over the grape, but you don't understand that this is the only trick I can do. Whereas Mm -hmm. Aaron, and I like this version of Aaron's interpretation, but he thinks that I was just like, don't fuck with me and my trick. You're in my house. (laughs) So all of that was about two decades ago. So it's lost to the sands of time as to why that happens. But yeah, that that definitely did happen. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Uh, This one is from Jim Thebo. Oh, no. So he said, if you're doing any museum tours, how can people sign up? Oh, okay. That's nice. Yeah, I, I, uh, I do enjoy taking my friends to museums. It's also something I have like a Patreon where I do like skate and art content Mm -hmm. and people can just find, you know, like message me on my Patreon and if they're in town and I have, and we can work it out, like I'll definitely give them a museum tour. Cool. So people can find me. I'm not going to use your podcast to promote my Patreon, but that's the easiest way. And if not, just like send me, send me a DM. Like more often than not, it's an honor for me to like lead anyone through a museum. And I'm so thrilled that anyone wants to hear me blab about art for 90 (laughs) minutes in, in a museum. DM. But yeah, that's that's it. I hope I don't regret saying that. But yeah, you're gonna get like tons of DMs. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's that's how Jim got got his museum tour from me. So that's a sweet one. Thanks, Jim. He also asked um, Green Day or Rancid. 
there's literally no difference between it's the same thing <laughs> i don't know rancid i haven't heard of it but yeah yeah it's uh jim's part of this like whole like east bay punk scene that where all the music is is indistinguishable and so i think he's trying to like make a joke that these are two separate bands but they're actually not it's all the same like if you you've probably heard it in like the part of the four-on-one videos that you fast forwarded because it was like a boring contest section in like you know antioch or something but yeah (laughs) i love this okay cool all right let's do the very last one hello my question for you, I hope, is pretty simple. As skateboarding's kind of go-to art critic, and as my own personal go-to art critic over these past few years, you've always just been extremely generous with both me and now you're having the chance to be more generous with skate culture more broadly with your show on Thrasher. My question for you, though, is maybe about a time when your knowledge and experience with the visual realm uh, has butted up against the limit. And I guess what I'm asking is, is what is your experience with the sublime? What is your experience with beauty? Uh, And have you ever encountered a beauty that has frustrated your um, formidable skills of critique and understanding and analysis? Thank you. I'll take my answer off air. Thanks, Kyle. Kyle Beachy, for your question. I knew that was you from a mile away, so... Just to clarify, I'm not an art or skate critic, but a nerdy scholar and historian of both, uh, which is to say that I don't make arch judgments or diagnoses about where we are through my descriptions of the culture, but instead try to tell a story about how we got here. To me, there's a difference, but I'm not sure if that tracks with everyone else. So to answer your first bit of your question, as I understand it, the sublime is a concept that describes a transcendent emotional experience inspiring awe and terror in equal measure. In contrast to the Burkean notion of beauty, which is something satisfying to behold because of the aesthetic pleasure we take in experiencing it, the sublime threatens to destroy us. The sublime is turbulent, chaotic, and should make us feel tiny, insignificant, and powerless, which is kind of how I felt in listening to your question, in fact. In its most extreme expression, we are sublimated, atomized, ground into nothing, and thus at one with nature. Having just recently watched Palace's beta blockers, I realized that I usually experience something akin to maybe what J.M.W. Turner, famous romantic painter, may have felt tied to the mast of a storm-tossed boat at sea, overwhelming terror and bewilderment mixed with awe, as if I'm witnessing something that I can't possibly understand or express in traditional language. So yeah, I guess uh, Palace videos are my sublime, whereas strangely, the music of the band Sublime is beautiful to me. Thanks, Kyle. All right, well, yeah, let's wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Ted. My pleasure. I mean, thank you for what you do, because I I do think that these type of conversations about skateboarding, as unwieldy as they can be, are probably the most important conversations that we as skateboarders can have. It's so hard to articulate this thing, and these type of interviews are the way that we stammer towards meaning. So thank you. I appreciate it. That's it for my conversation with Ted. Follow him on Instagram at Ted Barrow for your daily dose of art and switchback tales. Check out some of the panel talks Ted has hosted at Pushing Borders and Slow Impact on YouTube. Support him on Patreon at Berate the Birds. And obviously, if you haven't watched them already, I highly recommend you go check out the This Old Ledge San Francisco pieces on the Thrasher website or on YouTube. And keep an eye out for the next ones, which should be released shortly. Thank you for tuning in. See you soon for a new episode of Beyond Boards. Beyond Boards.